Paul was all about gathering people together from different disciplines and different aspects of life to talk about um, to talk about a number of important issues. And that's what I hope today, in honoring his memory, that that's very much what we're about. So now I want to uh, introduce our dean, uh, Kelly Testy, who's the James M. Mifflin University Professor of Law, and she's been a dean here since 2009, after four years deaning at that law school across town. Uh, but she brought with her the Jesuit and Seattle U commitment to social justice and devotion to leadership, both the theory and the practice. Uh, she was dean throughout Paul's time here, including his installation as the Henry M. Jackson Professor of Law. Dean Kelly. Well, good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to be here with you this morning and to welcome you to this conference. And uh, I do want to begin by uh, um, sort of re-recognizing Ginny Meacham, who's here with us today. And I hope you'll join me in thanking her for being here and just recognizing her. It's really nice to have you back in the day. I also want to uh, begin by saying a thank you to everyone who's made this uh, symposium possible. Uh, the program looks terrific, and one of the things that I really love about it is that it's a deep collaboration among a number of our uh, campus units and uh, people both within and without the, the law school. And so many thanks to the planning committee, uh, Steve, uh, Sharon Brown, and also Beth Riven, uh, and many thanks to the Disability Studies uh, program here and all the other campus units who are partnering with us. It's one of the things that I love so much about UW. We work very closely with uh, a number of the other schools and colleges, and it really enriches the kinds of issues we're able to tackle. I often say that our, our deepest problems of social justice will never be solved by one discipline alone. And this, of course, is a very good example of that, where uh, commitments to equality are certainly a start, but then just in terms of implementation, there are many other disciplines that need to be at the table uh, to make that promise of equality more, more real. So I wish you a wonderful day and uh, look forward to the, the conversations. Uh, I hope you'll make yourself very much at home here in William H. Gates Hall and let us know if there's anything that we can do to make the time that you're with us more enjoyable. One of the things that um, I wanted to share with you uh, this morning is just, first of all, how much I miss Paul and how much I loved working with him. Um, it, it is, uh, we knew each other a long time before I became the dean here, and so our relationship goes back many years before 2008 or 9 when I first came here and was first trying to entice him to give up President Obama's transition team in favor of coming back to the law school. And I always like to joke that that's proof of my persuasiveness, that I actually got him to reject Obama and pick us. Um, in fact, he picked his family. But anyway, I can keep you know, kidding myself about that. But one of the things that I want to share with you that has, I think, been just um, even more wonderful than I had imagined at the time is that what Paul and I worked on together when he came back from Washington was to redraft the mission mission, vision, and goals of, of this law school. You know, I was aware of what he was up against in terms of his health. I loved working with him so much. I valued his perspective on law and legal education so much. And so I asked him to chair a strategic planning committee and to work with me to redraft, as I began my tenure, the mission for the law school. And we identified leadership for the global common good as our unifying mission. Um, and really, it was something that um, I was just so pleased to be able to have, not only in that shorthand expression of what we're about, but in the longer description of that, and then in the embodiment of that in our programs and our way of educating lawyers, uh, to have been able to work with Paul and to have his voice in that mission. And it has been one that has resonated really strongly, both within the law school and outside the law school. Um, you all know that our world needs leadership. Uh, our world needs leadership for the global common good. Uh, and we believe, Paul and I believed uh, very strongly, that lawyers can be those leaders. Lawyers can be the leaders who light the pathway to a just world. And that's what we hope to inspire our students uh, to do and to be. It's what we try and do and be every day that we're here. And so every day when I walk in this building and I think about the work I'm about to do, I'm animated by that mission statement and always bolstered by the fact that so much of Paul Miller is in it. 
So have a very good day today. I'm just delighted that we're here together. And uh, I'm happy now to turn the mic over to my colleague, uh, Anna Mastroani, who will share some remarks with you as you get started as well. Thank you. Thank you. Among many other things, Paul had a passion for jazz. I remember him saying that jazz was all about appreciating the spaces between the notes. So many of us here today have our own memories of the notes and the spaces in between, and none more than Jenny, his talented and accomplished wife and partner. The notes of his career begin long before his arrival at the law school. He spent time as a litigator. He was a member of the Clinton administration. He was a member of the Obama administration. He was the longest serving commissioner on the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, serving under Democratic and Republican administrations. He was no less than a leading voice in employment and disability law, nationally and internationally. He shared his expertise all over the world. It is a testament that he was so readily able to apply his skills to academic law, where his scholarship continues to have an important influence on public policy today. So those are but a few of the notes that anyone could find in CVs and Wikipedia and news searches. But what about the notes in between? Paul Miller was a friend, a colleague, a fellow parent, a college classmate. Depending on the day, Paul would either thank me or blame me for his decision to move his family across the country to Seattle from that other Washington. Regardless, we were the beneficiaries. I can think of many words to describe him, but none really suffice. He was patient, but also infuriatingly impatient. He was patient in that day by day he would fight the small battles for disability rights. A Seattle parking lot that failed to have spaces designated for disabled visitors. His refusal to lunch at places lacking access for patrons with disabilities. If he experienced a barrier or even perceived an injustice, he did not shrink from the fight. He addressed it no matter how small and no matter how much time it took. As he told me, he believed that he had a duty to use his privileged position to give voice to those who were denied a voice. We shared an office wall, and let me assure you, it was indeed a loud, booming, penetrating voice. And at the same time, he was impatient. His impatience for the slow progress of civil rights energized him. He accomplished at least three lifetimes of work in his one lifetime. Either way, one lifetime or what seemed like three wasn't enough for him or for any of us. I recall him talking about the need for disability rights to really go global. He pondered how he could best play a role in that ongoing crusade. And looking around the room today, I'm sure he's smiling. And I'm sure he has high expectations. Despite a booming voice, he listened. In one-on-one -on -one conversations, Paul was one of those rare individuals who made his audience feel that they were important and that their opinions were respected and valued even when he disagreed. In a large group, you'd see him punching the keys of his Blackberry while also listening intently, staying removed from the debate until the last moment when he would invariably present a practical solution designed to bridge disagreements as much as possible, shifting the discourse, subtle and diplomatic advocacy. We are all connected to Paul. Whether you worked with him, heard him speak, or are here today, we are all connected. I have referred to him as a human catalyst because he had a unique ability to bring people together and in doing so, spark human synergies. He intuitively understood that bringing people together could have an effect far greater than the simple sum of their individual efforts. 
Let me leave you with one final thought for the conference that connected my work in bioethics and Paul's work in civil rights for people living with disabilities. Paul believed in personal responsibility. If you worked hard at any task, you would earn his respect. As a scholar, Paul was at the forefront of legal thinking in a number of areas, including genomic research. While the human genome was being mapped, he immersed himself in the science and thought hard about its potential applications in the workplace. His scholarship and policy work on genetic discrimination foreshadowed and influenced how this cutting edge area of science would challenge our understanding and interpretation of the law. And I invite you to think about this in the deliberations that come. So, here you and I are, just as he would have planned it, here, today, with an opportunity to engage in intellectual exchanges and debates about issues that he was intensely and personally committed to. So I ask you to listen with respect, be patient and impatient, and experience those synergies that this conference is designed to inspire. Thank you. Comments and I'm gonna I'm gonna try to be brief because I'm really looking forward to the QA. Again, my name is Andy Imperato. I am relatively new as the executive director of the Association of University Centers on Disability. So we're a network of centers around the country represented here today by the University of Washington's Center on Human Development and Disability. And you're gonna hear Michael Rolnick, who's the director of that center, speak on the next panel. Um, this is a network that was created by Eunice Kennedy Shriver to really try to change the lives of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities starting back in the 1960s. Seattle and the, and the program here uh, was one of the first programs. The, the uh, leadership on this campus was also brought to uh, Washington to kind of um, start a division at NIH that was investing in research that would uh, produce better quality of life for people with disabilities. So um, there's a lot of reasons why this is a good, in my view, this is a good campus to be hosting this kind of a discussion because it's a campus that's been working on civil and human rights for people with disabilities for, for a long time. Um, I, I'm uh, a lawyer as, as I was introduced. I'm a second generation disability activist. Um, I have bipolar disorder myself and I've been open about it throughout my career. Um, Paul was uh, my boss. I worked for him at the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission from 1993 to, let's see, no, 1994 to 1997. And um, it was a lot of fun working for Paul. I don't know that we fully captured how much fun uh, Paul was, but he, he was kind of a rascal. Um, he, he had a very good sense of humor. Uh, he loved life. Um, probably my favorite experience with Paul was going with him to England, and he ended up having many trips to England, but I had an opportunity to go with him on his first trip, and I think it was his first time in Europe. And he was invited to speak to the all-party disablement group by Lord Ashley of Stoke, who was a member of the House of Lords, uh, who chaired that group and who was hard of hearing himself. And interestingly, there were a number of members of the House of Lords who had disabilities, and that's, that's true today as well. But... Um, it was just fun because, you know, I think Paul was 35, I was 31, um, both of us were kind of kicking ourselves that we had anything to say to Lord Ashley of Stoke about <laughs> this topic, but um, it, it was just, it, we had a lot of fun. We, I remember we went to a party with lawyers that were doing disability work in London and we met a barrister named Jonathan Swift, I kid you not, <laughs> and um, he he, told, he invited us to lunch at the Inns of Court. So we had lunch with him at the Inns of Court. We went to the Prime Minister's questions. It was just a really, really fun trip. And um, I think one of the things I liked about Paul is he never kind of took himself too seriously. It's like he would be having a beer with a member of parliament and then look over at you and kind of wink. He's like, can you believe that this is happening? Um, but so I was asked to talk about kind of what, what is happening in Congress and why around the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So 
I, I don't think Arlene covered this, so I'm going to cover it just briefly. The way that we become a party to a convention in the United States is two things need to happen. The president needs to sign the convention, and then uh, the United States Senate needs to have at least a two-thirds vote that supports ratification of the convention. And different countries do this in different ways. A lot of countries will sign and ratify a convention, and then they'll figure out, okay, what do we have to do to be in compliance with it? That's not how the United States approaches conventions. We sign the convention, we do an analysis across multiple agencies to make sure that we are currently in compliance with it. We write reservations, understandings, and declarations that clarify our understanding of what it means for us to be a party to the convention. And then after all that has occurred, we have a vote in the Senate, and if we have a two-thirds vote, um, we, we can become a party to the convention. So President Obama committed, Senator Obama committed when he was running for president, that if he were elected, he would sign the convention. President Bush uh, elected not to sign the convention. I think the position of the Bush administration, which they articulated early on in the process, was we will support this effort and provide technical assistance because we recognize that we have expertise in this area, but we do not intend to become a party to this convention, largely because we don't think it's necessary. We already have civil and human rights for people with disabilities in the United States, and we don't think us becoming a party to this convention is going to be necessary or helpful. Um, that was not Obama's position, um, and when he was elected, uh, he started working, uh, Valerie Jarrett was very instrumental, working on uh, making it possible for the convention to be signed when we celebrated the anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act uh, during his first year in office. So on July 26, uh, or around July 26, we had an event at the White House where the President was there and Secretary Clinton was there. The President announced his intent to sign the convention and then it was signed a week later by Susan Rice at a, at a ceremony at the UN on behalf of the President. Um, at that point, the doc so that was in 2009, the document was sent around to all the agencies. I think state and justice played a kind of a leadership role, but multiple agencies weighed in, did an analysis, and <clears throat> they sent the documents up to the Senate in the spring of 2012. So that was a long process from July of 2009 to the spring of 2012 to do the, do the analysis. And they sent it up saying that we've done the analysis and we believe that we are in compliance with this convention. We recommend that you vote on, on ratification. And then we had a process in the Senate that was relatively fast by UN convention standards. There was a, 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 a hearing in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee that was linked to the ADA, ADA anniversary again. And in Washington, we often use the ADA anniversary, July 26th, to try to move uh, policy issues and priorities to the community. Um, they they uh, were able to have a bipartisan vote in the committee, including uh, Senator Luger, the ranking member, uh, voted f in support of ratification. Uh, Senator Barrasso on the committee also voted in support, a Republican from Wyoming. Um, the, the, at that point, the convention was ready for a floor vote, and uh, after the presidential election, during the lame duck session of Congress in December, we had uh, a floor vote with Senator Dole on the floor and his wife, Elizabeth Dole, also a former senator, on the floor, encouraging their colleagues to vote in support. At that point, there were 99 senators voting because Senator Kirk from Illinois had had a stroke and was recovering from the stroke and wasn't able to be there for the vote. So instead of needing 67 votes, which you would need if you have 100 senators, we needed 66 votes, which would have been two thirds of the folks voting, and we ended up getting 61. So we were five votes short. Um, fast forward to this Congress, you have a new chair and a new ranking member. So Senator Kerry, who was the chair of the Foreign Relations Committee, is now the Secretary of State. Uh, Senator Luger did not win his re-election. He was challenged in a primary in Indiana. Um, so the new ranking member is Senator Corker from Tennessee. And that team of, of uh, uh, the new chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee is Senator Menendez from New Jersey. So that team of Menendez 
and Corker have been working on bringing the convention back. They had two hearings in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee that was, were well attended on a bipartisan basis. There are two new Republicans on the committee who were not on the committee last time, um, so who have no record of voting against it in the last Congress, Senator Flake from Arizona uh, and Senator Johnson from Wisconsin. He, he voted against it on the floor, but he didn't consider it in the committee because he wasn't on the committee. Senator McCain, who was a lead Republican supporting the convention, was added to the Foreign Relations Committee. So where we are now is we've had two hearings and we're, we're waiting for a, uh, uh, a committee vote. And Senator Corker and Senator Menendez and their staff have been sitting down trying to rewrite some reservations, understandings, and declarations in a way that would make it more comfortable for Senator Corker to support the convention. And Senator Corker did a press release uh, along with Senator Alexander, the senior senator from Tennessee, indicating that those negotiations had broken down and because of that, he was not intending to support the convention. And that, that happened right before the holidays. So where we are right now is trying to get Senator Corker back to the table and um, you know, working on having it be possible to have a very strong bipartisan vote in the committee. Because if we don't have a strong bipartisan vote in the committee, uh, it's, it would be very difficult to get 67 senators on the Senate floor. Um, so what I'm talking about is probably going to sound strange, and I'm not, I want to be clear. I'm not speaking on behalf of Senator Harkin. I was working for, for him when we were doing a lot of this work. I'm just reflecting on what I saw and, and why I think it happened. Uh, but it's not the official policy of the Senate Help Committee or Senator Harkin. But in terms of why, why have we not passed the convention, um, I'm going to give you four reasons that I see as the biggest reasons, and I'm not giving these to then have you say, oh, that makes sense. I don't think it does make sense that we haven't passed it, but I'm just trying to understand it. Um, number one, I think the tough political climate in Washington can make it more difficult for the Republicans that would need to vote for the convention in order for us to get to 67, because we had all the Democrats last time, and we expect that we would have all the Democrats again if it went to a floor vote this time. But in order to get the Republicans that we need, we are going to need some Republicans to take on conservative forces in their own state to vote for this convention. And a lot of Republican senators are feeling vulnerable to a challenge in a primary from the right. You've probably seen this happen in a number of states. So there is a risk, a political risk for a Republican senator to uh, endorse this and take on the Heritage Foundation and some other groups that have opposed it. Uh, they call it getting primaried, but uh, you know somebody may emerge the next time they're up for re-election and use this vote to say this is not a true blue Republican and um, we're going to challenge them. And I think in general, when I worked for Senator Harkin the first time in 93, there was a lot more bipartisan cooperation and collaboration in the Senate. At that point, and that wasn't that long ago, if you looked at the most conservative Democrat and the most progressive Republican, there were a lot of senators in between them. So there were Republicans who were more progressive than a number of Democrats, and there were Democrats who were more conservative than a number of Republicans. That's no longer true. <laughs> the most conservative Democrat is still to the left of the entire Republican caucus, and the most progressive Republican is still to the right of all the Democrats. So when you need 67 votes, these folks aren't used to working together on a bipartisan basis, certainly not as frequently and not with as broad a bipartisan coalition as was true in the early 90s. And if, certainly if you look at the vote on the Americans with Disabilities Act from 1990, that, that, the vote on that was 91 to 8 in the Senate. So a lot of bipartisan support for that. And it's just a different Senate uh, right now than it was back in 1990 or 1993. Second reason is we had a very strong mobilized opposition to this convention. You had Rick Santorum, who, uh, believe it or not, has a following uh, on Twitter <laughs> and elsewhere, uh, who talked about his daughter with a disability and how this convention was going to somehow threaten her and his family if we were to become a party to it. Uh, and, and there was a caucus uh, of uh, kind of conservative uh, 
forces that heard that call to action and really mobilized against the convention. Um, we also had the Homeschool Legal Defense Association uh, decide, and interestingly, the lawyer that is, seems to be the leader of that group also was very active against the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. And he made kind of the same argument in both contexts. He said, if we were to become a party to either one of these conventions, you as a parent who are homeschooling your child will have the UN telling you that you can't do that anymore. So there were a lot of parents around the country who heard that message uh, and, and were uh, concerned and, and weighed in in big numbers with their senators. Just to give you a sense of, and that was probably the largest grassroots push against the convention, to give you a sense of just in Senator Harkin's office, for every 50 call, for every one call we got in support of ratification, we were getting 50 calls against it as it was coming up to that floor vote. So the mobilization against the convention was very strong from a grassroots standpoint. I mentioned the Heritage Foundation also came out against the convention. And the Heritage Foundation had a history of weighing in on, on conventions in general and had relationships with the Foreign Relations Committee. And it certainly created a dynamic where senators were more wary of supporting the convention. Uh, the third reason that I think uh, we weren't able to ratify it last time, and we haven't gotten there yet, and this is kind of subtle, but I think some of the arguments that we're using in the coalition to get the U.S. to ratify the convention can also be used against us. Uh, so, for example, one of our strongest arguments, and these are arguments that we use with Republicans, and it's really all about convincing Republicans. That, that is our task if we're going to ratify the convention. One of the strongest arguments we use with Republicans is that if we become a party to this convention with the reservations, understandings, and declarations as they've been drafted, it will require no change in U.S. law and it will not cost anything. So th that's, that, we, you know, that argument is intended to reassure uh, a senator that might be worried about, okay, what are the unintended consequences here? But the, the, the quick refrain, and we heard this from Senator Johnson from Wisconsin in one of the Foreign Relations Committee hearings was, well, then why do we need to become a party to it? I mean, if it's not going to change anything in the United States, it kind of goes back to the Bush administration's argument for why we didn't want to be a party in the first place. If we're not changing anything, then why, why is it necessary? And I think we have answers to that. And I thought uh, Secretary Ridge's or Governor Ridge's answer to Senator Johnson and the Foreign Relations Committee was really interesting because he's a Republican governor from Pennsylvania and a history of leadership on disability issues, former Secretary of Homeland Security, hard of hearing himself, veteran. And he said to uh, Senator Johnson, Senator, I think this is about the American brand. What do we stand for as a country? And he said, I can't think of anything that will make the rest of the world feel better about the United States than our leadership on disability as a human rights issue. And I thought that was very powerful. It was a crisp statement. It's, he seemed to just come up with it on the spot. Um, but that, that actually was, a, I th also thought, a good way to talk to a Republican about why it's good for us to be part of a UN convention. Because a lot of people just don't like or trust the UN. And they think if we become part of these international instruments, we somehow give up our sovereignty. And then finally, and I, I think you know, depending on the timing, this last one can be a big thing or a little thing. But I think there is still reluctance in the United States Senate on the Republican side to give the White House a victory on anything. <laughs> so, so you, you keep in mind that it came up to the Hill in the spring of 2012. What else was happening in the spring of 2012? Uh, we were, you know, in the middle of a presidential election. Uh, the president had made a commitment to do this. He had an opportunity to, to fulfill that commitment, but in order to do that, he needed two-thirds of the Senate to support it. And I think some senators were reluctant to do that. Some senators also indicated reluctance to vote in support of ratification during a lame duck session of Congress because they thought it should happen during the regular order. Obviously, that's not an issue now. We're not in a lame duck session, and we're still having challenges. So I don't think the lame duck issue ultimately was a big one, but it was an issue that some people pointed to. So finally, uh, how, am I doing okay on time? About two minutes. Okay. So finally, I just want to end with two positives because this can be depressing. 
uh, and I have experience with that. So the, <laughs> the first one is I, I want to give you the optimistic path forward, okay? Best case scenario, what, what's going to happen? The optimistic path forward, from my perspective, is Senator Corker comes back to the negotiating table with Menendez. Maybe they bring in other people to help, help them resolve their differences. Uh, and we get to some reservations, understandings, and declarations that both of them can live with. And we get a bipartisan vote in the committee. I think if we get Corker, we've got a shot at Flake and Johnson. If we get all three of them in the committee, I think we have a very good shot to get 67 uh, votes on the floor. And I think if we get Corker, we can also get Alexander, even though he did a press release with Corker saying he was going to vote against it. Um, I also think the, the period between the, floor, the vote in the committee and the floor vote is going to be a very interesting period. <laughs> we learned something the last time around. I think you're going to see the disability community mobilize with coalition partners in a much more aggressive way than we were able to do the last time around. So the veterans community is much more activated this time than they were last time, including some groups that are considered pretty conservative veterans groups like the American Legion. They, they are solidly in support of ratification of the convention. Uh, we have large companies who, for whatever reasons, have decided to endorse ratification, including Walmart. And when Senator Harkin met with one of the senators from Arkansas, that senator said, if Walmart were supporting this, it would be easier for me to support it. Well, Walmart is now supporting it. Um, NASCAR is supporting it. I have, to, I have to give an AUCD staff person who had a relationship with NASCAR credit for helping to make that happen. Um, we have IBM supporting it. And I, and I think there will be more and more companies. The US Chamber of Commerce is supporting it. But I think now that Walmart's out there and IBM, some of these folks are out there, we're going to see more and more American brands deciding that it's a good thing to be supportive of this convention. So I think that can matter. I think that Kelly Ayotte, who's been much more active on it this time, she actually testified in support of the convention in front of the Foreign Relations Committee and read a letter from Senator Dole. And she read it with a lot of passion. I think she will be very active between the committee vote and the floor vote. So I think all of these things together can help us get to 67. And then the final thing I want to say is, let's assume we don't get the vote. Let's, for whatever reasons, it stays bogged down. I just want to say that this effort I, has a lot of collateral benefits from my perspective. First, we've identified veteran leaders that want to be out there on disability issues. Tammy Duckworth testified in front of the Foreign Relations Committee in support of the convention, the Vietnam Veterans of America, American Legion, Iraq and Afghanistan veterans, lots of the veterans groups have weighed in. And I think that creates a coalition opportunity for the disability community on other issues that we're working on, like getting more people into the workforce, promoting accessible technology. There are a lot of other issues where I think if the veterans voice was at the table, it could help us move those issues. I think Kerry, Menendez, Ayat, and Barrasso are four leaders on this convention who could be leaders on lots of other disability issues. And the fact that Kerry is the Secretary of State and, and came to that job with recent experience leading on an international human rights issue for people with disabilities means that we have a Secretary of State that sees it as, as a priority to promote human rights for people with disabilities around the world. Whether we're a party to the convention or not, that's a good thing. Um, I also have seen it unify the disability community like I haven't seen in 20 years in Washington. I wasn't here when we did the ADA. But going to those two hearings, particularly th during this Congress, all of the top leaders from the deaf community, the blind community, the veterans community, physical disability, mental health, intellectual disability, self-advocates, we had a breadth of leadership like you don't typically see at, at hearings, and also just the number and people flying in from around the country. So that unification is good for our community and good for our movement. I think it's something that we can leverage. And finally, I think that it has educated the Senate Foreign Relations Committee members and staff in a way that will benefit us for the long haul. They know a lot more about disability as a civil and human rights issue than they did before this process started. And that's something that we can leverage when we're working on lots of other issues. So thank you. I look forward to the Q&A.
Well, it's a great honor to be here. Um, I knew and I worked with Paul Miller. Uh, we counted ourselves as allies on a variety of causes. Uh, and we were good, if not really close friends. I'm a, I, my office is down at the other end of campus away from here, so I didn't have the opportunity to see Paul on a regular basis, but we did get together um, fairly often. I remember very fondly lunches with Paul and, and various other discussions where we would talk about um, our passions of law and politics uh, and jazz. I had forgotten about jazz until it was mentioned earlier. I remember one discussion we had about the merits of Charles Mingus um, and his contributions to jazz where we took different views on that. Um, but Paul um, was a force here at the University of Washington and in the world as a leader and advocate for rights of people with disabilities. Um, I miss him personally, and I think we all miss him as a force on this campus and in our community. Other than that connection, I'm perhaps an unlikely contributor to this conference, less qualified than some of the other distinguished speakers who are wearing their little purple ribbons. Um, I'm not a specialist in disabilities policy, law, politics, or, or uh, teaching. Um, I do have personal family connections uh, to experience with disabilities. Uh, my wife is a special education teacher, um, although I often challenge that label that she, I think, too often accepts. Um, uh, and I've been in, uh, played a very small part in the development of disability studies program on this campus. Um, I, I think my role here is primarily at, as a um, sociolegal scholar, which is to say a social scientist who studies law in practice, not just law in the books, but how law works in society uh, in interactions among people, the kinds of communities that law does or does not create. Um, much of my interest in particular is on law and social change or law and social movements, uh, and that was the point of a lot of my conversation with Paul. Um, but, in, uh, but also, uh, I'm particularly interested in rights and the way in which rights mediate relationships among people and the kind of community that, that rights um, constitutes or potentially constitutes or in many cases fail to constitute. Um, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about rights. I had thought about talking big picture about law and social change and mobilizing the grand level and comparative international perspective. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought I'm going to think small and local. Uh, and so I want to talk about rights right here among us um, and what we know. I learned from Paul and many others um, the disability studies as an academic project is political activity because um, disability itself is a matter of politics. Uh, for a long time, thinking about disability in the policy and academic worlds, um, disability was relegated to the applied fields of medicine and social work, rehabilitation, special, special education, counseling, and social work, where disability is seen as a problem of individuals that need to be fixed or mitigated by experts. The person with disabilities was the problem. The larger society, especially the world of experts, was a source of accommodation and remedy. In contrast to the traditional medical model of disability, both movement activists and researchers developed what is often called the social model, alluded to earlier, um, which, which takes the focus away from the disabled individual as someone to be fixed, cured, or rehabilitated, and focus instead on the ways in which experience of disability is a product of disabling environments, social structures, and stereotypes, again, as political. Disability was re-envisioned as a social construct rather than an individual deficit, and people with disabilities of minority groups, similar to other minority groups based on race and ethnicity, who experience discrimination, exclusion, and various forms of harm. Again, this, un this view underlines that disability activism and research uh, in the social model is inherently political. Both are guided by the commitment to recognize and ending political and social marginalization of people with disabilities. Remedying the effects of discriminatory society in this view uh, is a form of civil rights enforcement similar to that um, that's been advocated by and for other minority groups. Following the civil rights model, then legal rights and remedies become central players in this new understanding of what it means to live with a disability. Redefining persons with disabilities as entitled rights-bearing subjects has aimed to some degree to invert a deficit into a form of social empowerment as people take back the public sphere and claim a space, respected subjectivity that has long been denied. The claim that disability is a social construction and not the inevitable result of personal injury or illness has revolutionized the ways that disability is talked about, both in, in, amongst activists in the disability rights movement, but also in the academy. And, and it has fused together, I think, connections between academic study and politics. 
Uh, as Cindy Linton explained in the introduction to her book, Claiming Disability, uh, the, the origin of disability studies created as a counterpoint to the medicalized perspectives on disability emanating from the applied fields and in response to the marginalization across the curriculum. Disability studies evolved along with disability activism. And this has meant that in co many college camp uh, campuses, the disabilities has, if very slowly and all too slowly, taken root in the social sciences, the humanities, law schools, as well as in <coughs> medical schools, policy schools, schools of social work, and the like. But what does the political project of mobilizing around rights for rights of people with disabilities entail? I would suggest that there is a sort of divergence or a bifurcation in the ways in which the issues of disabilities has become politicized. One approach has been what I would suggest is a top-down model of law and the, and, and, and the use of law as a, as a resource for social change. Um, what we need in this view is legislation and court decisions and an infrastructure of regulatory and administrative enforcement that will mandate organizational action to make good on basic rights of persons with disability and who um, experience discrimination, exclusion, and harm. In the United States, which became an internationally acknowledged leader in rights-based activism, uh, after the passage of the America with Disabilities Act, that social model is conceptualized as a minority rights model to mark disability as a second generation um, in this legal rights tradition. And the ADA has been undeniable in its impact. Um, the aim was both to remedy discrimination against persons with disabilities and to reduce or end recognitions of difference as a source of marginalization and exclusion. And then it's in turn has required accommodations to allow access and in a world of work to enable persons to perform jobs, make a living, and contribute as citizens, fully a part of the community of rights-bearing individuals. Now, much of the activity in the top-down model is focused on the state uh, or on other authoritative um, legal bodies, on legislators, on courts, on administrative and regulatory officials, on the role of lawyers in, in, as intermediaries, um, all who, who play important roles in creating conditions for entering activity as well as prohibit invidiously discriminatory treatment. Um, and, and, and so change is primarily imagined by going to the state, mobilizing uh, the authority of the state, winning rights, and then building uh, structures of implementation, enforcement, uh, and remedy to create a different world that's more open, accessible, and supportive of people with disabilities. And it's been hoped that change in the organized world will reduce marginalization, increase interaction among differently enabled people in ways that increase understanding, respect, and inclusionary social practice. The assumption is that once the majority of citizens gain increasing contact with people with disabilities, discriminatory attitudes and fears of the unknown uh, other will fade away Remedying the effects of a discriminatory society is a form of civil rights enforcement, again, similar to other forms of minority rights. Um, so that's, and, and that's a very important form of activity. This policy activism uh, is, is critical, and it, and it is essential to uh, change, to realizing, to making rights real, as a, a friend of mine wrote in a very important book. However, we have to also recognize that much of this action in academic study focuses on elite activists and is far away from the world of ordinary people, ordinary individuals who are, who are dealing with issues um, raised by social stigma, discrimination uh, against those with um, disabilities. Uh, and one of the things that's critical here, I think, from what I do as a socio-legal scholar and lots and lots of socio-legal research, is realize you can create a whole infrastructure of law and enforcement and regulation and support but if people at the point of experiencing harm, discrimination at work and in other sites, don't name those forms of injustice, who don't claim rights, who don't take action to, to make those cases known, then law doesn't often mean a whole lot in changing society. Um, and so that what we need is really a mix of top-down legal construction and bottom-up legal mobilization, precisely by those individuals who are most victimized uh, in society. Now, so you can build a field of law, but you can't automatically assume that people are going to come as players. And that's, and, and, and that's what's really vexing, because as a socio-legal scholar, decades of study of people, especially who experience discrimination, have demonstrated that people, individuals, tend to be very reluctant to claim rights, to name injustices, to stand up and call wrongs by their name as wrongs, 
and to try and change the situations. Um, lots of studies uh, of women, of racial minorities at work, um, the poor, uh, have all shown that individuals are very reluctant to take up and put rights to work to make rights real in their own individual lives, even when there is a whole infrastructure of law and support um, that we would hope would make a difference. Um, and a, part of the reason for that is simply that to claim rights against discrimination often only reinscribes one's status as less than fully equal. To say that you discriminate me because, against me because of my difference is to say that I am different and that I need um, some special kind of accommodation. Um, that while the claim of equal rights is often stigmatized in society as special rights. We're all familiar with those who get special rights. The, that special rights are what people in dominant society like to label is less than fully equal by those who make those claims. And that's often internalized by people who experience discrimination in a way that's, that, that is very paralyzing and creates lots of um, reason for reluctance. Now there's a lot of study um, of people with disabilities, but most of that study does a good job of demonstrating the experience of discrimination, but presumes that law is the answer, that law is going to fix that. And, 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 but much of that study is by activists who were involved in making law in the sort of state realm and official realm and so forth, but doesn't really attend that much to the experiences of ordinary people who are far from the courts, far from legislators. Um, often have very little interaction with lawyers and other forms of support um, that might help redress those problems of denial of rights. Um, and so l let me mention uh, a study that I teach often, a book by two socio-legal scholars, Frank Munger and David Engel, called Rights of Inclusion. And what they did was different than most of the other studies that I've seen. They interviewed 60 individuals um, with disabilities. They're ordinary people, not activists, not really even aligned with any activist groups, not involved in politics, but just ordinary people in their individual lives. And what they did was that they developed life histories. They spent many hours interviewing individuals, often in three and four interviews, many of the interviews were 15 to 20 hours in length, to talk about the life experience and how disabilities figured into that experience. And what they were interested in asking was, in the years after the ADA was passed, in the mid to late 90s, has the ADA made much difference in these people's lives? Do they experience their um, uh, social roles as rights-bearing individuals? Do they feel empowered by the ADA? And that's what poses the challenge. That what they found was that most of the individuals they talked about, almost all, talked very little bit about the ADA. They didn't know much about the ADA. They, they were very reluctant to talk about rights. And when they experienced discrimination, which was very, very common, they were very reluctant to do anything about it, to exercise voice, to name those injustices, and to claim those rights. And that was the question that Munger and Engel asked, is why is it that after the creation of a new law that recognizes basic rights of those who experience discrimination, why do they play such a small part in the imagination of individuals? Um, in fact, none of the 60 people that they interviewed um, had ever talked to a lawyer, much less filed a lawsuit when they had been discriminated against. Most had not gone to any form, a union representative or a human resources specialist at work, or sought any other support from a disability rights group. Most sort of suffered, or dealt with their, not sorry, but dealt with their situation quietly and individually. So why is that? Um, well, what they found from the, in these narratives that people told was that a variety of social values often uh, presented uh, obstacles to rights claiming. That we tend to think we live in a society where everybody imagines themselves through rights, but we also live in a society that's constituted by ideological structures and values that actually often trump rights and make rights and belief in all our status as rights-bearing individuals um, less important than we often assume. What Engel and Munger found was that there are three different kinds of discourses that, that came up in narratives. One was uh, racial justice, one was the rhetoric of the market and merit, and a third one was rhetorics of faith or narratives of faith. Uh, and each of those in many ways conflicted with um, the assumption that, people, that individuals with disabilities are rights-bearing individuals and can claim rights or should claim rights or will be empowered by claiming rights. 
Perhaps the most disturbing finding had to do with the discourse on racial justice. Um, what they found was that while activists often think that the disability rights movement is very much a civil rights movement that builds on um, uh, the legacy of activism and the civil rights movement and the women's rights movement and other movements like that, they found that the individuals they interviewed were very nervous about that comparison. They were ambivalent about the civil rights movement and they were especially ambivalent, and this is especially true of, of, of uh, white people that they interviewed, were very ambivalent about thinking of themselves like black people, like people of color. And, and, and felt that those movements were not really meaningful and, and, and potentially empowering analogs for their own situation. Um, and I won't say much about that. Same thing was true for the rhetoric of markets, is that people tended to um, take very seriously the logic of market merit. And, and were very ambivalent about de demanding accommodations because that would only reinforce that they did not have the same merits and the same capabilities as other people did too. Again, it would only reinstantiate their status as somehow less than equal, less than fully independent, uh, less than fully deserving of rights. And that thinking about the, law, the, the ideology of markets and of merit that permeates our society, especially at work, really became a major obstacle for them. And there was also about faith. Um, religious values often um, counseled about humility and about um, just you know, lumping it or biting one's lip when one is victimized by discrimination to show uh, uh, generosity and forgiveness towards employers and others who did that. So what they found then was a fairly depressing picture, which is all this struggle to win law, new rights, and so forth was not really all that meaningful, was not really that empowering to individuals. As Engel and Munger say, that those who, um, what, what, one thing they did find though was people who were more likely to think about rights and to take action to name injustices and to claim rights were those people who most were able to separate their sense of self, their sense of identity from their disabilities. Um, as I say, those who tend to draw clear distinctions between disabilities and themselves um, hold equally clear conceptions of their entitlement to participate in mainstream social settings. And they said, those people, where did they, what distinguishes those people from the many others? And they said, it's mainly because they had lots of support groups and affirmation as they were growing up, especially when they're young and young years of school, that the more that they received affirmation from family and from close networks, the, the greater sense they had to make that distinction. But the great majority of people that they interviewed did not really show that inclination, did not really think of themselves as deserving rights-bearing individuals as member of the community, members of the community of rights. And hence, that's the dilemma is that to really, for law to become an effective resource for social change, we need not only the infrastructure of state law and support and organization and implementation, we need people at the points of discrimination, of harm, of exclusion, of marginalization to, to take action, to name their injustices and to claim rights. And how do we achieve that? And that's something that we find in almost every, every area of discrimination. But how do we, how do we solve that problem? Well, I don't really have time <laughs> to talk about it easy. And part of it is after studying and thinking and working on these issues as an activist and a scholar for a long time, there really is no obvious solution to the problem. But what's obviously, but what is critical, of course, is for individuals who are marginalized and experience harms of discrimination to find connections to other people, to become empowered by learning ways in, in hearing uh, others talk about their experiences of discrimination. That the assumption that people will just you know, take up uh, the cause and become rights activists once they learn about it is, is misplaced. We have to first understand, people have to have the ability to talk about their ambivalence, about the conflicts they experience, about their uncertainty, about the potential costs of claiming rights and taking action and challenging discrimination, and then have to have the opportunity to connect with other people and learn the possibilities that collective action can be empowering in ways that that overcome the situation of individuals in their own solitary, um, often solitary situations. So uh, how that happens um, and how that can happen, I could say a lot more about, but I'll just end by, by, by pointing to one place um, that matters, and that's right here in the academy. Um, I've talked about several times about how study of disabilities and disabilities activism have, gener have, have grown up together. There are many sites at which those struggles have to be fought. They have to be fought in national government, they have to be fought in bureaucracies, they have to be fought by lawyers, but the academy is a very, very important place. We as teachers have a role 
in providing spaces and places and amplification to people with experiences of discrimination for disabilities to speak up, to talk about their ambivalence, to talk about the challenges that they face, but also to share visions of aspiration and to find in the voices of others the possibilities of transformation where individuals can become part of a whole that hopefully can be more empowering. We also have a role in events just like this conference, which is to facilitate dialogue and interaction uh, among specialists and activists and ordinary people who experience discrimination for their disabilities. As teachers, as researchers, um, we have an important role to play. And that, I think, is part of the example that Paul Miller provided us. He certainly played his role in national government, as a national and international leader, an advocate for rights of people with disabilities. But when he came to the University of Washington, he also recognized the role of the academy, the role of us as teachers, as researchers, as facilitators of interaction among people with disabilities with the broader community and, and among activists. He provided us both an inspiration and instruction in doing that. And so I, but we all have to do a lot better. We have to do more and we have to do a lot better than we are. Uh, and uh, I applaud everybody who is committed to this project, um, but, but we need to do more. Especially appeal to administrators that we need resources and support. We need money, we need time, we need programs, um, and we need recognition for carrying on this project. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, and so at this point, then, I'm going to hand it over to Judy Human, who I will have to trust to keep to your 15 minutes, because I don't really have a way to give you the sign. So, <laughs> so thank you so much. Michelle, if I run over time, just tell me to shut up. Okay. <laughs> um, Skype is great. I'm very sorry I couldn't be with you today. I'd like to thank Steve and, and everyone who's put this conference on uh, for the hard work that you've done in assembling uh, the number of people, both in the audience and those of us who are presenting. I think it speaks very much to uh, Paul Stephen Miller's uh, great legacy, uh, what he's left for all of us in the U.S. and around the world. I had the privilege to know Paul while he was here in D.C. And for those of you who knew him, you know that he really excelled in all that he did, both as a father and a husband, um, as a sibling. Um, and his work in the area of disability was relentless. I think he, some of his major contributions uh, beyond the work that he did while, while he was at EEOC was really under the Clinton administration and then with the Obama administration, bringing disabled people into critical positions in government. And I think, you know, when we look at the Disabilities Treaty, um, one of the very important components of the treaty is the intent that dis disability will become a part of inclusion going on in all of our countries in the area of advancement of human and civil rights. And one way that that can occur is to ensure that people who have appropriate qualifications are brought into varied positions within government and the private sector. And the absence of that, whether it's in the area of race or gender or disability, uh, really means that there continues to be a void in the ability to sit down with colleagues to meaningfully look at both what the problems are and solutions to these problems. So I think, you know, in, in our discussions on implementation of the Disabilities Treaty uh, internationally, one of the clear issues that um, we're looking towards over the next number of years is the ability to move disabled people, women, um, and men into positions of authority where they themselves will be able to help influence the development and implementation of policy. So I'm going to speak today a little on the treaty. I know Arlene and others spoke more broadly on it this morning. Um, and I'll focus um, somewhat also on issues affecting women. Uh, but I think in my presentation today, some of my premises really uh, deal across the board. So who are we talking about when we're looking at uh, disabled girls and women? We're talking about a very broad group of people, I presume, as most of you understand. But one of the unique issues I think that we need to talk about more broadly is um, we're looking at people who have disabilities, like some of you in the room and myself, 
visible disabilities and people with invisible disabilities, but we're also looking at people who acquire disabilities over the course of their lifespan. And why I think this is a particularly important issue uh, when looking at disability in the area of gender, gender is because um, people acquire their disabilities in many ways. In countries where there are high degrees of conflict, um, high degrees of violence against, against women and girls, um, disability is one of the outcomes of this type of experience. And um, my, my experience both working in the State Department at the World Bank is that um, both in the U.S. and around the world, uh, we still do not have the level of collaboration between uh, women's organizations and the disabled women's community. And so in countries where uh, they're experiencing uh, contract conflict, high rates of violence, many of these women themselves who now are acquiring disabilities are not only being ostracized in their communities because women's community is not necessarily continuing to embrace them as members within their communities, uh, but they're also being ostracized in those communities, and they're frequently not a part of the disability community. Um, I visited a program in Ethiopia for uh, young women who had fistulas. The fistulas were caused by early marriages, um, repeated pregnancies, and uh, violence. And one of the results of fistulas is that women lose control of their bladder and their bowel. And even though there are now surgical procedures which can help these women uh, remedy these issues, they're still thrown out of their villages and they're still not allowed to return to their villages. These women all have disabilities and they are not necessarily being embraced by the women's community. So I think as we're talking today, uh, I, I'd like to say that for those of you who are involved um, in organization, women's organizations or international organizations in general uh, or domestic organizations, it's really important to begin to query these groups to look at what it is that they're doing. Sorry, it's a vacuum cleaner outside my door. Uh, uh, what they're doing to reach out to the disability community, to really get a better understanding of what disabled people, men and women, women and men, boys and girls, are experiencing. We know, for example, um, that disabled people are excluded from education in many countries. Uh, we know that even individuals who need basically no accommodations um, in their schools, maybe a ramp, but in some cases they can crawl up steps, are not allowed to attend schools. So we're talking about some very, very basic denial of rights, even in countries where they have laws on the books that are advancing education for girls. So um, the barriers that you know, we experience in the United States um, as disabled individuals, we all also understand are still in process of being removed. Uh, we're in a, I think, unique situation in the United States because of the strong civil rights movement um, that emerged in the U.S. over the last century. And it goes without saying that uh, the disability community in the U.S. would not be where it is today if it weren't for the advancement of the civil rights movement, the women's movement, the aging movements that began before the 1960s, but with legislation, uh, meaningful legislation that was developed um, in the United States. And I think it's uh, also important to look at the fact that the civil rights laws in the U.S., um, which were advanced in the 1960s, uh, took the United States until 1990 to be able to get comparable legislation um, prohibiting discrimination in the public and private sector. So if we look to the number of years that it's taken us to get um, laws in place that are similar to laws that were put in place for other minority groups in the United States. I think it goes without saying that when looking at countries overseas where 
their political structures um, may not be or, or are evolving. Or even in countries uh, in Europe where, uh, while they may have some very good laws, laws like um, architectural standards, etc., are weaker than ours. I mean, in the United States, we have a law which says any new construction must follow a standard. Any major renovations must follow a standard. Everyone has to follow the same standard. The states can put on a higher standard. The locals can put on a higher standard. But there's no longer a distinction between the public and private sector except in the area of housing. But in countries like Germany, um, they have standards for government buildings. But they don't have the same standards for the private sector. So again, when you look at where donor aid comes um, for developing countries, um, if the country that's providing the donor aid itself doesn't have good laws with effective implementation, and that's another area that I think, you know, in the United States we have done some very good work, um, both at the federal and state levels. Um, those of you who are lawyers and people like myself who are advocates clearly will uh, be able to make the case about how things aren't advancing as rapidly as we would like. But when you look at many other countries and look at their weak infrastructure to be able to have um, government agencies that have clear responsibility for um, reviewing complaints, um, uh, mediation, technical assistance, litigation. Many other countries do not have procedures like we do. So for me, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and the role of the United States is very important. Uh, the fact that we have still failed to ratify the treaty, I think, is um, very, very unfortunate. Um, obviously, um, while for those of you who have been following this, uh, know that Senator Corker from Tennessee, in the middle of negotiations, unannounced to the White House, the administration, Senator Menendez, who's the chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, um, uh, withdrew himself from the negotiations, saying that he would not be supporting ratification of the treaty. But in saying that, um, the administration and the Senate Foreign Relations Committee is still committed to working on this as are organizations like the United States International Council on Disability. Um, we believe that ratification of the treaty is not only important for United people residing within the United States over time to be able to um, travel abroad, study abroad, work abroad, as countries develop and implement legislation to remove barriers. But um, what we're equally concerned about is the fact that many countries, as I was saying, do not have laws like ours. So as they are providing technical assistance to countries that are developing new legislation that have weak infrastructures across the board, um, we need to be a player at those tables to be able to help at least give people information about why a strong civil society is important. Many countries do not have strong disability rights communities. Others don't have strong uh, civil society communities because governments have been afraid, as you all know just from reading the media, of uh, enabling people to organize. But in the U.S., we continue to speak abroad about the importance of civil society and the disability community, the important role that the disability community can play working with government and across um, uh, other uh, human rights organizations, religious community, veterans organizations, etc. Because it's those of us who have the knowledge about the kinds of barriers that we are experiencing. But we also believe it's really important to be able to help people get a clearer understanding about what effective remedies are. What is a good piece of legislation? Um, what does it mean to have legislation effectively implemented? What kinds of agencies do you need to have in place? What do you need to do to address issues like corruption, um, which is a big problem, as we all know, in many countries? But I, I believe that, you know, your role as, as lawyers or people involved in advocacy who are interested in disability rights, there are multiple opportunities that we can look towards to really help advance the work that we've been doing here in the States. Uh, for example, I think it's relevant 
uh, to identify people um, at the university and in your communities who may have disabilities who come from other countries and may still be in communication with people in other countries. Doing things like DVCs and other kinds of uh, approaches to help people get a better understanding of what our laws look like broadly, um, what is discrimination, what does it mean to be protected against discrimination, uh, working with countries that have ratified the treaty, um, making sure that we can help expand the knowledge of people who on a reasonably regular basis travel to other countries so that they can in fact speak with the disability community, with government officials, with civil society, human rights organizations to help people get a better understanding of what we're talking about when we talk about discrimination. What kinds of remedies are there? What is the Department of Justice? What is its role? You know, what various agencies have been doing? It takes a long time, as you all know, to help people um, not just get information, but understand the information. Um, if you're living um, in a country where uh, these types of issues are in fact not addressed, um, then it is kind of abstract. So one of the other issues that I think is really important is as we look at inclusion, which is what I think we're about both in the U.S. and what the treaty is all about, um, advancing disability rights also enables other human and civil rights organizations in other countries through learning about what the ADA is, what Section 504 is, what the Civil Rights Act of 1964, et cetera, are, and about the kinds of coalition work that we've been doing here in the U.S. at the state level and national level with groups like the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights. All of those things are critically important. So let me conclude by saying um, that we each have a very important role to play in the work that we're doing. Uh, fundamentally, I think, um, in order to advance the rights of uh, women and girls with disabilities around the world, we need to look at what the barriers are that people are experiencing. We know that lack of education, primary, secondary, lack of health care, lack of accessibility uh, to uh, basic uh, transportation, um, health care facilities, discrimination in the area of employment, et cetera, really um, keep people, uh, disabled women and girls and boys and men, out of becoming meaningful members of society. And uh, one of the most important issues, I believe, is in the U.S. and other countries where we have been advancing laws for decades now, we can also show how effective implementation of these laws really is making dramatic changes within our countries. And that working collaboratively together and acknowledging that human rights must be granted to all people within our countries and allowing people to see the role that they can play, uh, small or large, is uh, very important in helping to ensure the effective implementation of this treaty. Thank you very much, and hello, Jenny. talk a little bit about Paul. Um, Paul was a mentor to me. I met him while I was working at the Department of Justice for a summer in the disability rights section. A mutual friend introduced us. Um, I met him for coffee. I was admittedly very intimidated. I had heard a little bit about his experiences at Harvard Law School. That was where I was and was about to finish law school. Um, I wasn't sure how much of a safe person he would be in talking about uh, what was happening, what I was still seeing some years later. Um, and I remember talking to him about it. I couldn't help myself. It just sort of came out. And I was like, oh, gosh, let me take it back. And he said, you know, rather abruptly, so what are you going to do about it? And so I really had to think about that going back. OK, so enough of your gripe session, law student. What are you going to do? But it was in a very compassionate way. And I have to say, I came out of that conversation really feeling quite energized but also feeling like I had a lot to do. 
and that it wasn't enough to just kind of complain about it. When I went into law teaching, he was really a mentor to me, and um, towards the end, he started sending me very good projects. I didn't know that his health was also declining, so I thought at the time that he thought a lot about me, and perhaps he did, but I also <laughs> realized, sadly, that, um, you know, I was really, we were all in the process of losing him. And so, um, during the last few months that Paul was alive, uh, and this was also when I wasn't sure about the state of his health, a number of us in the American Bar Associ Association wrote a book called Lawyers Lead On, which is letters of mentoring advice to the next generation of lawyers with disabilities. And I'd asked Paul to write a letter for that book, and we ended up dedicating the book to him. Um, and I want to just read part of his letter before I talk about women's health issues. Paul said, as a law professor, I have sought to make legal education less alienating for all students. To have students explicitly identify their professional and personal goals in the law and to facilitate an ownership of their careers. I think that being purposeful in one's life and career is important, especially for a lawyer with a disability. One should chart one's own path and set out to follow it rather than simply to select from the paths that seem to be available. And I would do a footnote there and say, you know, many people with disabilities feel like they have very limited options and can't speak up about them. And owning one's own life leads to greater happiness and satisfaction. So I was thinking about that letter and thinking about the issues that women and girls with disabilities face here in the US and abroad. Um, it might seem difficult to make this kind of transition between Paul Miller and the reproductive health of women and girls with disabilities, but I'm going to try. <laughs> so I think he was interested in that as well. Um, and let, before I discuss what I mean by unwell women, let me just say that I think the greatest contribution that the UN Convention makes is in its statement of values. Um, and I should say this from the context of having taught law for six years, and I'm currently on a hiatus, and um, having brought a Ukrainian citizen into my house who is also a little girl with a disability who is uh, four and a half and at, EU, at the EU here at the University of Washington in developmental preschool. Um, you know, I talked, have talked to my law students about the UN Convention. They, af usually after teaching the Americans with Disabilities Act, they've always come away and said, well, that's really utopian and I don't know what to do about it. You know, as we're trained as law students and lawyers and law professors, we want to have something that we can implement, something that we can measure. And for this, and for them, it's a bit unsettling to just have a statement of values, a, a very utopian one, they feel like, after having studied all the challenges that people with disabilities face in the US. And we're supposed to have it pretty good, right? Um, but I've asked them and challenged them to kind of think about what this might mean how, even if they just concentrated on one provision, what things might look like, and what those provisions are actually saying about what they look like now. So um, recently, my own work has started to focus on this separation between disability and health law. And we know that Paul was very good at bridging that divide. But we're also seeing a rise, with, even within our own national health care reform, with a focus on wellness. And I'd like to say that wellness excludes people with disabilities. And there's something very insidious about it, because how can you want someone to be sick? After all, isn't that the opposite of being well? But unlike the UN Convention, it, um, the notion in the US seems to ignore all of the social, cultural, economic, material, and resource factors that go into being well, and people's access to that kind of life experience. So I want all of my friends with and without disabilities to be well. But I think that what we've done is really taken a step backwards in moralizing personal responsibility, individual responsibility, and assuming that there's this normal status, an optimized status, that everyone can reach. And that's what really concerns me. So I was thinking about the UN Convention as well on the rights of people with disabilities, as well as CEDAW and the Covenant on Economic, Cultural, and Social Rights. I was thinking about what alternatives it gives us. So I figured we'd spend some time talking about that. Um, because I think it might be a, a way around this dominant discourse about what wellness is and how accessible it might be to people. So for my purposes, CRPD, CEDAW, and the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights basically serve three purposes. They recognize that health is embedded in everything. You know, if our 
Definition of disability is slippery within CRPD. Our definition of health is even more so. So health is in your food. Health is in your interaction with your colleagues at work who might raise your blood pressure because I've had, I had a moment where I was teaching at a law school in which one of my future colleagues thought I worked in the mailroom because I had a disability. <laughs> um, that really impacted my wellness, I should say. <laughs> Probably that of all of my friends who had to hear the rant as well when I came home. Um, uh, but it's a systemic issue. It's not just measured by a blood pressure cough or a BMI chart. And I feel like these three initiatives really expose how our very notions of gender and sexuality affect and inform how people with disabilities have access to health and wellness and access to society and community and supports of all kinds that lead to greater physical and emotional well-being. They also make access to health a fundamental right and they explain that it starts with reproductive planning which is something that can be such a sensitive issue here and abroad and access to health services. So we really think it begins at the beginning for both the in terms of making choice in those areas and having autonomy and having support and really ownership over one's life and really charting one's path. Um, and this might seem all very basic, in fact, but as we've talked about so far, it hasn't been for people with disabilities, particularly women and girls with disabilities. And I'd also like to say, even though the uh, designated focus of my topic is women and girls, I'd have to say that this also applies in so many different areas, including people who are not gender conforming to stereotypes that might exist within their cultures. And this, statement of, this restatement of values is so important, but it's not one that people in general, women and girls who have, with disabilities, have had, had access to in their own lived experience. And it really doesn't matter if uh, so much um, you know, the importance is still as relevant here in Seattle as it is, say, where my daughter came from in Ukraine. And they signed and both ratified the convention, but you could have fooled me, really. <laughs> I lived there for two months, and I just wanted to get home. I think I was going to beat down someone at the airport when my flight was canceled <laughs> and be detained <laughs> because I just really needed to get out. Um, but really, you know, it was a situation where um, there really wasn't much of a future there for people with disabilities and uh, a lot, not a lot of organizing going around um, and where children are institutionalized and then in, in baby houses to be attractive to foreigners as a form of economy and then shipped out to institutions when they're four or five. So that was a difficult thing as a person with a disability and I'm an interracial couple to visit every day for two months and think, you know, this could be your life experience and you can't take everybody home. So, um, and also, there was an issue for us, I think, in this process, and I'm happy to talk about this, and I'm going to get too off into a personal um, direction, but uh, there was a question when I found out about this possibility of adopting our daughter, whether or not I would be allowed to adopt our daughter because I had a disability, and in general, they don't adopt to people with disabilities. We're talking about a UN convention ratifying country. They don't adopt people with disabilities. So our interpreter was always saying, this is the law professor. <laughs> so I learned very quickly to say in Russian and Ukrainian, this is my husband. He looks like a chipmunk and he is an engineer. And I am a law professor. And I had to do that when people give me change on the streets because I was a person with a disability. Um, I'll talk briefly about the problems that women with disabilities and girls face in the areas of health and wellness. And we know so many of them. We're talking about forced and coerced sterilization. We're talking about forced contraception or limited access to it. And in terms of thinking about contraception, it's kind of nuanced. I mean, many girls and women with disabilities are pressured into using long-acting contraception, such as Depo-Provera, to make sure that they really don't reproduce within those fertile years. And I have seen doctors here at the University of Washington, when I have expressed interest in having a child, who have said, well, maybe after the first one, we could do a hysterectomy. You know, that would be good. It's going to be a lot for you. You know, they're sort of partially honoring my desire to reproduce and perhaps create genetically deficient offspring, but curtailing it in a way that makes sense within their medical community. So a focus on menstrual and sexual repression um, and suppression, which is something that I know Paul worked on, poorly managed pregnancy and birth. Um, forced or coerced abortion, as well as not having access to making that kind of decision. Termination of parental rights. We know that parents with disabilities are 10 times, can be up to 10 times more likely to have their children removed from their custody. 
Um, denial of or forced marriage. Uh, medical stripping, which is not something we talk about very often, but happens so much even with our own healthcare system because of the time pressures and constraints and how we expect services to be delivered. So, you know, you end up naked in a room for residents before you've ever even met a doctor. And this is under the best of circumstances here. You know, this is our sort of first world problems in terms of even having access to healthcare and even having someone to talk to about what your period is. Um, Lack of freedom to express LGBT identity safely. Um, lack of access to appropriate and accessible preventive services. Uh, Gender-based violence, and we know it comes from both family members and caregivers. It comes in the form of hate crimes and people who might need the support of their families and are not able to travel freely or to be economically self-sufficient or have supports in those areas don't feel like they can report it, or if they do, there will be retaliation, which could escalate the violence. Um, lack of full exploration of the connection between poverty and disability. The World Health Organization loves to talk about this, but I don't know exactly what we're really doing about it um, beyond saying we know that poverty causes disability and disability causes poverty. So what are we doing to improve our supports there? And in this mix, there's often a dominance of a one-size-fits-all approach, which can be imported from the U.S. or somewhere else. Um, seeing the experiences of women with disabilities and girls with disabilities the same as men with disabilities. Because for so long, we know from the literature and the theory, girls and women with disabilities and people with disabilities have been considered asexual. So we're all kind of the same. And so the fact that there would be an interest in expressing, um, uh, you know, interest in reproductive health or um, having children or talking about how you can avoid not having children or having a sexually fulfilling life is rather uncomfortable. Um, and most important, there's been a denial of legal capacity and decision making. And the UN has said that that kind of denial, especially in the area of reproductive rights, is a serious violation and it's an ineffective public health intervention. These practices happen, I think, because we frame disability as a personal tragedy, a burden, and a matter for medical management and rehabilitation. I would also say that there's this really difficult relationship between how we treat disability as a personal experience, uh, me making it a private experience where other people do not feel compelled or motivated to intervene and address injustice, uh, versus how we make it a public experience, where we expect people with disabilities to tell us their lives, their life stories, to listen to ours. I, I hate going to the grocery store sometimes for that reason, because I, you know, I <laughs> go back to my husband, I'm like, this doesn't happen to you. And he said, no. But, you know, I find people, I was at the paint store the other day, some guy was telling me he's afraid of the dark. He's about 60 years old. <laughs> I'm like, okay. So for a while, I thought I should become a shrink because maybe I could just start billing right there. Um, so what's CRPD's vision and what's CEDAW's? Well, let's start with CEDAW. I think that CEDAW, given when it was written, um, which is over 30 years ago, really has a traditional focus on marriage and family for women and really changing that situation where men are making these decisions and really lauding over women. Uh, it has many provisions for family planning, access to reproductive care, child care support, which seems revolutionary to me as the child of, uh, as the child of a preschooler. Sometimes I am the child of a preschooler. <laughs> as the parent of a preschooler, my little Ukrainian's quite dominant um, and opinionated, now in English too. <laughs> and it really has a passing nod to race in the form of looking at issues of colonialism and really no direct discussion of disability, but that would have been revolutionary at the time. And in some ways, when I was reading through it, I was thinking, this is kind of the second wave, and I hate to think about it that way, but for people with disabilities, women and girls with disabilities, they really need shelter and freedom from violence and a mean of income and support and just even access to health care before we start thinking about these items, which unfortunately have been labeled for us as luxury items, kind of the next thing that people think about. But I think CEDAW has really evolved. I saw recently on, um, through an organization that I'm involved with, which is called Women Enabled, which works on international human rights issues for women and girls with disabilities, a report from Columbia, for example, talking about forced sterilization of women and girls with disabilities and also looking at the effects of trans identity in that community. 
And CRPD, as Arlene said, treats disability as an evolving concept. It's pretty revolutionary in that way. So, um, what I'd like to say is that CRPD and thinking about disability as an evolving concept is really the revolution. We're thinking about responding to increased individual pressure to attain health and wellness, to really comply and comport with our employers' desires to keep health insurance premiums down, for example, or to place less of a burden on the rest of society. Um, I think CRBD and CDOT, to a lesser extent, offers us an opportunity to stop measuring, judging, and blaming people uh, for their health status, to stop moralizing, to remind us that you really can't get away with that. Have you really provided the basic supports for people to exist in the community? to exist as full citizens um, before you start telling people that they're falling short, particularly women, for failing to meet standards for productivity, power, strength, and even aesthetics and beauty. Uh, CRPD shows that health, or lack thereof, is a social responsibility, and it really kicks the butt of dominant notions of health as individual superiority or failings if you're sick. And I think we can do better, and so I'll suggest a few ways that we could do better. It's not a new idea, and Judy talked about this a little bit, that we really need full integration of people with disabilities, particularly women and girls, and people of color, um, people who are expressing LGBT identity or are gender non-conforming within mainstream UN activities, particularly for, for women. Uh, often you'll see that uh, activities for women and girls with disabilities, for example, are hosted as a side event, and they're not part of the mainstream agenda for UN women. But I'd also say that you have to integrate disability goals in the post-2015 human rights framework, particularly in the area of eliminating violence of all kinds. And you need some standalone goals for non-discrimination and equality, as well as gender equality. I think public health and wellness folks, as well as health law folks, really need to be educated about the centrality of disability. Uh, disability is not the state that you enter into because you fail to be healthy. This is, we're interested in health for people with disabilities as well. And I have to say in academia, there's been a real divide there. Um, and it has played out also in our community centers and delivery of services. I think we need positive understandings of disability without going in the direction of super cripping or hero worship or too much inspiration porn, although it can make us happy sometimes. We all like a little inspiration porn. Um, we'll admit it. <laughs> I saw it in your browser history, all those stories about people with disabilities. <laughs> and you can live up to the utopian values of the CRPD, right? I mean, my students are always like, I, I don't know what to do with this. You know, it's the end of the semester. They're tired. They're fatigued. They're like, oh, what punch was that? This would be nice, but I don't really know if we're going to get there. And I think that is about integration and thinking about people and addressing attitudes and thinking about people as gendered beings um, and having some choice and interest in expressing that. Um, and everything from mainstream public health and sex ed to visual representations of beauty. And the CRPD is lovely in telling us we need to support the arts and really support research funding in those areas. So thank you so much for this opportunity to talk about this. I hope that we'll see a future in which disabled people's organizations are really more empowered to invigorate this dialogue and engage with wellness and health folks on these topics. Steve asked me to focus on a particular group of <clears throat> children and families uh, who could benefit from special supports and services uh, so that their child in particular will, um, so that their child, thanks a lot, so that their child in particular will uh, be able to develop more fully uh, to enhance their child's particular well-being and perhaps most importantly put the child on a uh, pathway for full inclusion in society as the child uh, moves into various developmental phases of life. These kinds of supports and services we refer to as, <clears throat> excuse me, as early intervention. But Steve also asked me to do something else, which was to sort of place this uh, early intervention perspective in a, in, a, in a worldwide framework and try to link it, if I possibly could, to uh, issues of the, the international treaties. 
Let me just talk about what this challenge is for early intervention. I mean, there really is a very high expectation that if we provide these kinds of comprehensive supports and services that we're going to enhance the development of children who already exhibit delays, whether those delays are known or unknown, we're going to have a meaningful effect on the developmental trajectory of that child and we're going to be able to prevent any number of secondary complications which often occur. But also for children who are at risk for delays, through these programs we're also going to have a, the possibility of, if not uh, minimizing those delays completely, at least tempering them somewhat. Now to do this really, as you can imagine, requires a Herculean effort, a remarkable type of integration among all different types of services, health, education, social services, put together in some kind of comprehensive format, uh, requires a, really a, a broad thinking group of individuals who can think of other disciplines and work together in some kind of meaningful interdisciplinary framework. Now that problem alone is complicated by the extraordinary magnitude of the scope of the problem when we think about it from an international perspective. Just look, look, just look at intellectual disabilities alone and look at the potential causes of those. For example, we have a whole range of biological conditions that can lead to cognitive limitations. Malnutrition, including micronutrient deficiencies such as iron, uh, genetic disorders, which we now know are about 3,000, infectious disease, head injuries, low birth weight, newborn asphyxia, prenatal exposure to drugs and alcohol, lead poisoning, malignancies, and cardiovascular disease, and that certainly doesn't uh, complete the list. And then we have this, on the other side, this entire range of environmental and psychosocial uh, conditions, including poverty, child abuse, child neglect, and the list uh, goes on. And of course, very often these biological and environmental conditions co-occur, making it extremely difficult for development to occur in its most optimal way. Now, when we think about it, worldwide uh, we see about 780 million children just birth to five are affected just by intellectual disabilities alone. When we look at some studies that UNICEF has supported over the last few years uh, and uh, been reported, we can see, uh, again, the kind of dramatic problems that all of us in the, who are involved in the early childhood period must contend with. They've identified at least 23%, an enormous number, who are at risk for, for an established disability in low and middle income countries. So having said all of that, we can certainly ask the question about why spend so much energy in these first few years of life? Why is it so particularly important? Why would we want to make a, a major investment in this kind of thing? I'm going to offer uh, three reasons. First, I think it's a pragmatic humanitarian one. It is during the first few years of life, uh, we really meet the needs of families under the most special period possible, frankly. We need to focus on issues that, during this period, that immediately strengthen families and support them because they're going to have a long pathway, hard pathway, throughout life. And in fact, if we design these kinds of programs well, we can have a tremendous effect on, to address this pragmatic uh, humanitarian rationale. Studies have demonstrated clearly we can reduce parental emotional distress, enhance their coping, be able to build very thoughtful support networks and provoke, promote parents' ability to feel confident and competent that they can do this particular job. The second uh, reason why it's useful to consider investing tremendous amount of energy in the first few years of life is we now know from a lot of research through neurobiological mechanisms and behavioral mechanisms then we have a special window of opportunity in the first five years of life where there's a unique plasticity to alter the course of development. And in fact, that's exactly what happens when we provide very thoughtful, systematic, and comprehensive, experientially based, not talking about biomedically based programs, we can really uh, enhance the development of children exhibiting delays uh, for whatever reason, and we can prevent delays from occurring for children at risk to a very substantial degree. And I'll talk just a little bit about that, more about that later. 
And the last reason is that this is an, you can think of this as an investment in the fact that it generates long-term benefits. One benefit you might think is financial benefit, and that is true, but the real benefit, I think, is the enhancing of the quality of life and being able to produce, have individuals in which they participate as actively as possible in all aspects of community life. And when you look at the data, the data are very clear. Individuals who participate in early intervention programs require fewer special services. As adults, they are much more productive and they participate in communities to a much larger degree than those who don't. Just to give you an idea how significant the problem is if we do not provide early intervention services, this particular graph illustrates that if in the absence of early intervention, what one sees is a general decline over the first five years of life of social and cognitive competence. And that decline is a rather significant and dramatic one. Just to show you that this isn't hypothetical by any means, this is a series of uh, studies that were done in the 1960s and 70s and 80s before the advent of early intervention programs from countries all across the world for children with Down syndrome. And you can see that uh, this decline in, in development occurs over the first five years of life when these programs weren't available. Later on, when those programs were available, also from all over the world, and I've just chosen a handful here, you can see that that decline is prevented. Of course, children still have many difficulties, but it's really a dramatic effect to be able to reduce or eliminate that particular decline in development over the first five years of life and what all that entails. From studies, in studies done here at our center, for example, for, is another, is another uh, example from children who were born prematurely at low birth weight. If you look at the control group here, you can see a, an absence of early intervention yields a decline, which is almost one standard deviation, which is a gigantic number uh, for young children. The intervention group, when we provide comprehensive intervention, we're able to slow that de decline considerably. Many of these families have co-occurring uh, poverty and all sorts of family and lack of social support issues, and yet still we've been able to make great gains. My point is, is that we now have a knowledge base and a conceptual base and an empirical base which demonstrates that we can make a dramatic difference in the lives of children and later on in the lives of adults through the provision of these kinds of early intervention services. So the question is, how does, what's the context here? How do international human rights treaties uh, uh, how relevant are they and can they be utilized for us to support initiatives worldwide to promote the development of these young children. And Sherry Brown and I about a year and a half ago uh, examined quite closely uh, the Convention on the Rights of the Child and the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and put together a, a very nice article to discuss these kinds of things to see whether or not there was certain relevance and we could highlight certain things in these two conventions that would strengthen our argument, not only just the empirical argument, but the more conceptual argument about the value of early intervention. And indeed, we were successful in that particular search. Uh, for the CRC, we identified uh, at least a, quite a number of articles. One of them, one of the points, it specifies disability is important to consider when CRC focused more generally on, on children supports issues supporting the development of children to their full potential. Clearly, early intervention does that. Non-discrimination and full inclusion and participation is obviously also critical there. Certainly, that's essential. We're helping families to begin to help their children move into a pathway of full participation in all activities, education in particular. Not part of the convention, but general comments by the committee uh, was really quite concerned about issues of institutionalization, as we, we heard earlier, based on disability status. And the CRC also, which we're very pleased to see, recognized quite, quite clearly the significance of the early childhood period. The CRPD had the same kind of thing, with participation and inclusion at all levels, articles reflecting that combating negative attitudes and stereotypes, the need for early family services, 
was quite important there, and we're very pleased to see that. And also pleased to see the emphasis on minimizing separation, because institutionalization of young children with disabilities in particular is a major problem throughout many parts of the world. And of course, the issue of inclusive education was stressed, and that is absolutely critical. And to begin that in the early childhood years, so that parents and children themselves have this expectation that they belong, and they belong from the beginning. I just want to tell you in the last couple of slides that we here at the University of Washington have uh, taken this particular chart seriously. Uh, we created the uh, first uh, society, International Society on Early Intervention, uh, and is still the only society. We have about uh, 3,000 members representing 100, 100 countries, and the purpose is to create networking, provide resources, stimulate projects all across the world, have major conferences, and create really an attitude and an expectation that early intervention is something absolutely critical and that countries need to, to really consider that. We share policies, we share resources, we share students, we share faculty, we, we share practitioners, so as to enhance, and, but I must say there is a major effort going on in the Ukraine as well. <laughs> Still to be realized. <laughs> Long haul. Um, the issue of institutionalization has been brought up so much, and it is indeed a, a major problem. Uh, we, um, uh, most of the problem is in the uh, countries that are in the Central and Eastern Europe, uh, the Commonwealth of Independent States, which is most of the republics of the former Soviet Union, where institutionalization is a gigantic problem. We have been working in our society to try to address that, and we held just a few months ago a conference in uh, St. Petersburg, Russia, with the theme being from institutional care to family environment. And we're trying to tackle there ways in which we can be demonstrate how services and supports and policy, regulations, rules, attitudes can indeed prevent institutionalization and if institutionalization occurs to move children as quickly as possible into environments which are going to support them in the most inclusive way that is possible. Uh, we are going to uh, continue this particular effort. There are a number of working groups uh, uh, that will be uh, meeting for the next two years and culminating in our meeting in 2016 in Stockholm for a major conference entitled Early Intervention and Children's Rights. It is supported by uh, UNICEF and I work quite closely with uh, UNICEF in that connection. And in, in, indeed, in addition uh, to that, it's uh, some strong support by the uh, Soros uh, group, uh, the Open Society Foundation, who has taken a uh, that is their charge as a major initiative, particularly in the former Soviet republics, to uh, reduce institutionalization. So we do hope that uh, in the future we, are, we will be able to address these kinds of absolutely critical problems, but we feel that uh, this is a most appropriate place to start and will ultimately, if we persist, will have a great impact on the lives of children and families. Thanks very much. Hi, can you all hear me or lip read me or something? Um, I, first of all, I wanted to say thank you. Um, I think most of you know that I'm Paul's wife or widow, and I just want to say thank you to everybody who was involved in this for pulling together the event and for attending and for taking these issues seriously. And I think that Paul is smiling down at all of us now and that he is totally tickled to see his work extended and continued like this. Um, I also wanted to say it's wonderful to hear so many people's reminiscences about the impact that Paul had, about how he brought people together, about how he was a big picture thinker. And I also want to add um, he really was not focused on disability. 
this is the thing that we're paying attention to right now, and this is something that he spent a great deal of his life working on, but his perspective was always that disability was one part of larger civil rights picture and a larger civil rights movement, and that people with disability could only truly realize our potential or win full equality if we understood the disability rights movement as being part of a larger civil rights movement. And he also had a true commitment to excellence. Uh, somebody, I can't remember who, said that he, uh, maybe it was, maybe it was on it, but somebody said, you don't want to be known as a person with a disability. You want to be known as a brilliant scholar and a hard worker who also has a disability. So I think that that is a challenge for all of us. Um, I also think that the, the intersection of human rights and disability here is it's something that people are paying a lot more attention to now, and that Paul was one of the first people to kind of push that issue forward. Um, I want to add from my own perspective, having worked and thought in this area somewhat, that I think there's tremendous, tremendous room for development in this area and that the meeting of the two areas of um, kind of, of, you know, areas like medicine, aid, and health development, which in some ways come from the medical model or come from helping the individual, meeting together with the law, policy, education, legal, kind of a formal structure approach to disability, that there's a tremendous amount of space for those two areas to meet. And that there's also a huge role for social entrepreneurship and cultural change within that to bridge those gaps. So I may say more about that later on, but um, thank you again for being here and I hope that this sparks a lot of uh, thought and reflection and action. And thank you for sharing your memory with Paul, with all of us. He said, I was two years old. I said, that's no excuse. <laughs> uh, but I did buy him a beer after that, so I guess it, it evened out. Uh, Paul, this is for you. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be talking today about international human rights and juvenile punishment theme, uh, schemes. And this is one of a series of articles that I am doing, looking very, very much from the ground up at the CRPD as it affects. And I think it can and will change domestic policies. I mean, Andy, we can you know, chat about that later. I, I'm writing about sexual autonomy in the CRPD, about guardianship in the CRPD, about problem-solving courts in the CRPD, about the criminalization of mental illness and CRPD, about conditions in forensic facilities and the CRPD, about sex offender policies and the CRPD. I should tell you, I was a lawyer, I was a real lawyer for 13 years before I became a professor, and I started out as a public defender, and I started out my starting out representing juveniles. Uh, and I still think of myself very much as a public defender who just happens to have been doing something else for the last 30 years. Uh, but this is something that has always interested me and I think is extremely important. And I think the whole question of how all of this that we are talking about relates to the criminal justice process can get lost. And by talking about this today, I want to bring it back on the table. Uh, in the last decade, the United States Supreme Court has issued three major decisions uh, ruling that the death penalty, that life without parole, and that mandatory life without parole uh, with, uh, for homicide convictions violate the Eighth Amendment in the case of juvenile defendants. And these, de these decisions were based in large part on, fun on findings of developments in psychology and brain science showing differences between juvenile and adult minds, lessening a child's moral culpability. These decisions have been welcomed by juvenile justice advocates as being positive, but none of these cases speak directly to the case of the juvenile with mental illness or mental retardation who is incarcerated either in adult facilities or in juvenile facilities for lesser crimes or for less severe sentences than life without parole. Such incarceration, I believe, in many instances, violates international human rights law and may violate the Eighth Amendment as well. Now, in the, in the uh, juvenile death penalty cases, the Supreme Court stressed that international law supports its decision. Consider Justice Kennedy, and, and by the way, 
I mean, no one should make any mistake about this. This is for the non-lawyers in the room. Anthony Kennedy, in a lot of ways, is the most important man in America because he is the swing vote on so many important cases. He's a person who could never be recognized by 90% of the public, you know, his picture you know, turned up on the news, but he has more impact on how America will be over the next decades than virtually anyone else in the country. Our determination, this is quoting from the Roper case, our determination that the death penalty is disproportionate finds confirmation in the stark reality that the United States is the only country in the world that continues to give official sanction to the juvenile death penalty. From the time of the court's decision in Trope v. Dulles in 1958, the court has continued to refer to the laws of other countries and to international authorities as instructive for its interpretation of the Eighth Amendment's prohibition of cruel and unusual punishment. He was flayed by Justice Scalia for this, of course, and this is one of the great battles among, among Supreme Court justices. But the point is, it is there. And again, in the wake of Roper, commentators argued that life without parole violated international human rights, and the Supreme Court has agreed. But the Supreme Court has not yet considered international human rights implications of one, the routine housing of juveniles in adult jails and prisons, or two, the disproportionate number of juveniles, of incarcerated juveniles, both in juvenile and in adult facilities with mental disabilities. That's what I'm going to be addressing here. Uh, I don't need to go into what the convention is. Arlene and Andy amply set that out before. The Supreme Court has not yet had a chance to look at this. But in the Graham case, it did note that life without parole violated the CRC, a convention, by the way, that has been signed by every UN member except for the United States and Somalia. So failure to ratify in no way, I don't think, stops the court from considering the CRPD in future litigation. My paper, and I have to tell you, I gave a much longer version of this paper at uh, Texas Tech Law School in the spring, and this is going to be coming out in the Texas Tech Law Review, uh, much as I was tempted to do it, I am not going to read you all 70 pages and 229 footnotes. That would be cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, so what I'm going to be talking about, relatively briefly, are about half a dozen different things. A little bit of a look at the data as to the mental status of incarcerated juveniles. Two, the conditions of confinement. Spoiler alert, some of these may make you lose lunch. That's how terrible they are. Three, the application of the CRPD. Four, if I have time, talk a little bit about something we haven't heard about at all today, which called therapeutic jurisprudence, a different way of looking at the entire legal system to see what have an impact laws actually have on the people that are being regulated. And if I have time at the end, which I probably won't, a coda to talk about the quality of counsel made available to juveniles. The beginning of my paper is titled, as you see from the program, Yonder Stands Your Orphan With His Gun. Uh, those of you who have heard me speak before and those of you who know me from other venues, thanks for coming, Bruce, I appreciate it, uh, know that I'm a huge Bob Dylan fan. Uh, this comes from Bob Dylan's epic song, It's All Over Now, Baby Blue. This is the first verse. You must leave now, take what you need, and I'm not singing it, for which you are all going to be very grateful. You must leave now, take what you need, you think will last. Whatever, what, whatever you wish to keep, you better grab it fast. Yonder stands your orphan with his gun, crying like a fire in the sun. Look out, the saints are coming through. It's all over now, baby blue. This song captures the sadness of somebody, and the quote from a critic is, with tears that would burn a hole within the largest star, and I think it's exactly what we're talking about. Okay, the evidence shows that the number of incarcerated juveniles with mental disabilities is alarming and is disproportionate to the juvenile population as a whole. It is exacerbated when controlled for race, gender, or family stability. Uh, youth in the justice system are always at a high risk for mental health problems. Linda Teplin, one of the great researchers in this area, has revealed that over 60% of male juvenile detainees and nearly 70% of female ju juvenile detainees meet the diagnostic criteria for one or more psychiatric disorder, and this probably underestimates it. If we include undetected learning disabilities, it raises to over 80%. Uh, the, the numbers are simply astounding. Uh, juveniles also have higher rates of physical injuries. 70% of juveniles being held in juvenile facilities in California have reported suicide attempts. In one state system, over half of incarcerated juveniles meet the criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder. So these are really sobering statistics. 
Uh, the, rate, the disorder rate for female detainees is significantly higher. There is disproportionate minority representation. Broken homes clearly are a major impact in all of this as well. Uh, I want to look briefly at some of the criminal law and criminal procedure issues that relate to this population. Because one of the things that's clear is that the criminal justice system has made no efforts at all to deal with this in issues like incompetency to stand trial or the insanity defense. This is totally unexplored in almost every jurisdiction. We know, and the, the, the research that's been done by Tom Grisso and his colleagues, juveniles under the age of 15, who in many jurisdictions are transferred up to adult court, perform at a level of impairment that is consistent with the levels of adults who have been found incompetent to stand trial. But in some states, courts are prohibited from inquiring into a juvenile's competency to stand trial. Not all states allow a juvenile to raise the insanity defense. Think about Miranda waivers. Virtually every juvenile under 14 who waives his Miranda rights is incompetent to make an informed decision on that. And if you get up to juveniles who are 15 or 16, at least a third lack the competence to waive their rights. This is all very, very troubling information. The criminal justice system ignores the fact that juveniles might not be competent to stand trial, might not be criminally responsible, and their opportunities for diversion to mental health facilities are diminished. And the, uh, ju these juveniles wind up in long-term detention facilities. What are these facilities like? They're terrible. Over 30 years ago, Jane Nitzer, who was one of the nation's most prominent child advocates, said the needs of juvenile, of children in these, in these systems are neglected and ignored. Ten years later, Joseph Kokoza reviewed it, said exactly the same thing. Ten years later, Mark Soler reviewed it and said exactly the same thing. And there has been nothing that gives us any hope that any significant amelioration is likely in the immediate future. Most states are barely able to ensure the physical safety of their juvenile inmates. Inhumane conditions are still very, very common. Some is nearly unbelievable. Professor Doug, uh, Doug Abrams reported on findings at the Oakley Training School and the Columbia Training School in Mississippi and, and made these findings. Children are regularly sprayed with lethal pepper spray as punishment. Suicidal girls are stripped naked and hot tied, forced to eat their own vomit. You can't make this kind of stuff up. And when there is treatment that's offered, it's often anti-therapeutic. Angela Burton reviewed how juveniles are over-medicated. Judges told uh, Professor Abrams that the, the children who appear before him in court are often appear to be in sort of a semi-coma. So these are things we need to take seriously. The juvenile justice system is a dumping ground. Uh, it was mentioned before about being transferred up to court up to adult court. The transfers are very often pretextual. They're almost always counterproductive. The transfer juveniles are more likely to reoffend, and they are five times more likely to be sexually assaulted, twice as likely to be beaten by staff, and 50% more likely to be attacked with a weapon than youth in juvenile facilities. Now, what does international human rights have to say about this? Well, there's a lot in the Convention on the Rights of Children. Article 37 says no child shall be subjected to torture or other cruel and human or degrading punishment. What about the CRPD? I believe the CRPD gives juveniles, based on some of the sections that both Arlene uh, and one, at least one of the other speakers, perhaps Andy, put on the board before, the right to the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health, to be treated with humanity and dignity. This is simply not happening in any of the United States at this time. Uh, scholars have talked about the application of international human rights law uh, in, to standards in juvenile detention facilities, to disparate gender treatment. It's all looked at the CRPD, but nothing has really looked yet at this, it's in, in, this in, in terms of the Convention on the Rights of Children, but nothing has really yet looked at the CRPD. It is clearly the most important development ever in institutional human rights as a uh, applies to this population. Article 7 applies to children. Full enjoyment by children with disabilities of all human rights and fundamental freedoms. The children I'm talking about get none of those. An article that talks about freedom from exploitation, violence, and abuse. Children in these facilities do not 
get any of that at all. Two-thirds of juveniles in facilities have a mental disorder. Uh, treatment is anti-therapeutic per se. What is this saying? Well, I what, what, two minutes left? One minute left. Okay. Uh, there goes the next section in which I would have talked about. <laughs> it happens. Yeah. Uh, I have two. Thank you. Uh, I was, what, I, what I do, and this is all, again, because this is an article that anybody is welcome to read. It's on SSRN.com if you want to look at it. Uh, I look at the therapeutic jurisprudence literature and says, for any system to work, there are three Vs, voice, voluntariness, and volition. And this does not happen at all in juveniles who are sent to these facilities. Uh, and very often, by the way, counsel is abjectly poor. Uh, some states have robust public defender offices. Others do not. In many jurisdictions, juvenile has a, there's a juvenile charge. The judge comes in. He says, all right, Mr. Rosenbaum, you're representing the first person. Uh, Mr. Jones, you're representing the second person. Ms. Smith, you're representing the third person. Maybe you're a bankruptcy lawyer. Maybe you're a copyright lawyer. It doesn't matter. Counsel is inadequate. Uh, and this is both morally bereft and legally bereft. I believe our policies violate international law. They deny individuals the dignity to which they are due. They turn their backs on the precepts of therapeutic jurisprudence. In, in an article I wrote about that critique the incompetency to stand trial process, I characterize mental disability law in this context as a fraud and charade, and I would apply the same words here. <coughs> One of the great Dylan critics, Oliver Traeger, talking about uh, Baby Blue, says it depicts a cold world in which nothing is certain but still brims with a kind of dark hope. The world of juveniles is cold, and little if anything is certain. But I retain some hope, because at the bottom of everything, I'm still an optimistic guy, believe it or not. Although it may be dark hope, that if we believe to take seriously the principles of international human rights law and therapeutic jurisprudence, our orphan with a gun may finally have a world that is a better place for all of us. Thank you. These children are apprehend apprehended and placed in deportation proceedings without lawyers. There is no constitutional right to counsel in immigration proceedings, which is a, a civil court hearing. Um, two years ago, the numbers of unaccompanied immigrant children apprehended rose from 8,000 to approximately 14,000, and it was termed a child migration emergency. Um, in 2013, over 23,000 children um, came from, to the United States, were apprehended and placed in deportation proceedings. And estimates um, for this year, for 2014, is that close to 54,000 children uh, may possibly be apprehended and placed in uh, deportation proceedings. Um, more than 10,000 children were deported to Mexico alone um, last year. Um, in 2012, about 3,800 children um, were, from, were apprehended from Guatemala, close to 3,000 from Honduras, about 3,300 um, from El Salvador. Um, these, all, all these children were apprehended uh, by Border Patrol. And so I, this issue first um, became on my radar um, about 12 years ago as a law student. In Spokane, we discovered, I was working for Columbia Legal Services, and we discovered that there were immigrant children being apprehended, arrested, and detained outside of Spokane at a juvenile detention facility called Martin Hall. And um, had, they had no counsel, and we discovered this, and we had a program called ICAP, the Immigrant Child Advocacy Project. And we began to um, represent and litigate on behalf of these children. And um, I will today speak briefly, I'll give you a, a little bit of overview of the legal framework and the, the five most common forms of immigration relief that many of these children, um, if they have a lawyer who is able to litigate on, on their behalfs, um, are likely eligible for um, in immigration court. And um, so we represented children um, in Spokane through Columbia Legal Services. And, um, I can tell you what happened as we started to litigate and, and uh, represent the children. Soon, um, with, within a year or two, uh, the contract that was with uh, Martin Hall was sort of taken away. And all of our clients were removed to a remote um, facility in Colorado. 
which made it that much more difficult for us to be their voice and advocate for them and represent them. Um, and that, unfortunately, there's been a trend of that nationally with these children where they are detained and held um, in custody in terms of access to, to counsel, which I'll speak a little bit more about. Um, and so now I continue to, to work on this issue, and we'll talk a little bit more about this um, toward the end of our section um, with the American Bar Association and a pro bono project that I help run um, on behalf of immigrant children in need of legal counsel. And um, of course, I, I teach about this issue with my students um, in a juvenile law course at Gonzaga Law School. So um, just briefly about the, the legal framework, um, in 1993, there was a uh, US Supreme Court case called Reno v. Flores. And um, that case upheld that the former INS um, could detain children um, in secure facilities for an indefinite period of time um, unless relatives appeared to claim them. And so this, uh, after this Supreme Court case, there was a settlement um, often referred to as the Flores Settlement, and there have been several other settlements that have been uh, subsequent settlements that have been um, entered into, but it sets up a, a legal framework regarding the treatment of these unaccompanied children. And for example, some of the uh, they're supposed to be le the least restrictive um, alternative to detention is supposed to be made available uh, for the children and to ensure prompt release from detention into foster care um, so that they're not being um, held um, in a jail-like or detention facility for a significant period of time. So. Um, so this is a, a serious issue that, um, can, as I said, the numbers are continuing to increase and some, there's some speculations as to why that might be. Um, there's been some recent changes, um, in, especially for youth coming from Central America, some changes in um, Mexican law that I don't know if it's making it easier for them to, to travel into Mexico and then um, continue on and immigrate here into the United States. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a really serious issue because these children, I mean, as young as five years old, they have no right to counsel. So they have um, very limited due process and um, they're left to defend themselves without a lawyer and they have no idea what, form, what the immigration laws say and what forms of immigration relief that they may be eligible for because many of them do qualify for different forms of uh, legal relief to remain here in the United States. So um, just briefly to shift gears, I wanted to just quickly highlight some of the, um, the five uh, primary forms of, of immigration relief that many of these children can qualify for. There's something called the Special Immigrant Juvenile Status. Um, that's a J visa um, under immigration law. And essentially, uh, if a child has um, been abused, abandoned, or neglected um, by one or both parents, um, so that's, that's the primary form of relief. And so um, we, through a project that I've been working on with the ABA, we've, we've been trying to um, provide free training and CLE for lawyers um, to obtain um, the legal um, skills and uh, training necessary to represent the children. Um, and second, asylum. Very often um, the, the children uh, may qualify for asylum depending on their circumstances and what country they have come to the United States um, from and if there's, there's five protected grounds of asylum and there's uh, many of the children do, do qualify. Um, when I was working at Columbia Legal Services, we'd often file both for asylum and special immigrant juvenile status um, at the same time. Um, U visas, um, if the children are victims of crime, they can petition for U visas and that has been a, a way to get relief for them and to help them remain here in the United States. T visas as well, if they're um, victims of trafficking, that's been another way that we've been able to obtain immigration relief or a VAWA petition um, under the Violence Against Women Act. Um, if they've been abused by um, a parent or spouse that is a U.S. citizen or a legal permanent resident, they can also obtain relief um, under the Violence Against Women Act. So um, just wanted to provide that basic um, legal framework and kind of highlight this issue and the need um, for legal representation of these children. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Professor Truthart. Well, thank you. Uh I think when we originally conceived of this topic, the focus was more on uh, unaccompanied, quote, alien children. 
uh, and the uh, listing for our presentation in the program was a little broader than that. But when we started thinking about it, I think that we realized there are actually three groups of children uh, about uh, whom we're concerned here. There are many others, but uh, there are unaccompanied refugee minors who come to the U.S. Uh, and you might think of the so-called lost boys of Sudan as falling into that particular category. And they're under a broader auspices of um, the UN High Commission for Refugees, and they have uh, longer-term protections in some respects. That does not uh, in any way indicate that um, their needs are necessarily being met, but that's one category. Um, as Jamie uh, was focusing on the unaccompanied uh, children, I'm, I'll refer to them as that rather than unaccompanied alien children, uh, and that's sort of the focal point of kids who may end up in detention uh, or there may be efforts to uh, place them in foster care subsequent to their arrival or to place them with relatives. And then finally, we do have immigrant children who come with their families, um, of course. And when we talk about the notion of forced migration, think about the fact that children who are coming with their families are sort of in a forced migration situation oftentimes too. They didn't necessarily choose to leave um, their schoolmates, their uh, home of origin and so forth and come to the U.S. So why is this, uh, we've already talked a little bit about why, uh, from Michael's presentation and what Jamie said, why this might be a human rights issue, but why is this a disability rights issue? And I think that that is important to recognize um, that a number of these children, Michael indicated that children in detention in the U.S., two-thirds of them may have mental health needs, and it may be an even greater or larger number if we put into the mix the wide range of um, disability-related uh, uh, issues that uh, that group might be dealing with. But part of the problem that we have dealing with children, so unaccompanied children, is the fact that we don't really have good statistics about what their mental health um, situations or needs might be. So part of our focus in being here today, I think, is among this interdisciplinary group of people um, who are coming from social work backgrounds, from uh, medical mac backgrounds, from law-related backgrounds and so forth, um, is we're sort of uh, encouraging, uh, which might uh, sort of link directly to the notion of therapeutic jurisprudence, we're sort of looking at how are ways that we can work collaboratively, even though uh, we may be viewing uh, this work through our lens as lawyers, but how can we work collaboratively to address some of these issues? Because as the uh, things that Jamie mentioned, I mean, we are dealing with children who are leaving their countries uh, because of forced prostitution, because of uh, involvement in gang-related activities. Uh, because they have seen uh, incredible violence uh, in their own homes, in their own neighborhoods, um, that uh, have been subjected to or trying to escape from child marriage, from forced genital, uh, from uh, genital, female genital mutilation. And so, um, although we know that mental health problems don't come necessarily from one source, they might come from a complex causal chain, you can imagine, um, as Lisa pointed out in her introduction, uh, the incidence of depression and PTSD that might result uh, in a population group such as this. So how do we know about what's happening with this group? Well, interestingly enough, uh, a lot of the evidence to date is anecdotal. Uh, and so that's why I, would, I don't have any s specific concrete suggestions for social workers or psychologists in terms of dealing with this group, but there definitely needs to be more um, information about what's happening uh, here because the anecdotal information would suggest, um, and this comes from groups such as uh, Kids in Need of Defense, KIND, uh, which I think is a wonderful acronym, uh, and as well as uh, from a number of documentary films. Uh, there are just three in the relative recent past, Point of Entry, Soul, Posada, and the reason why I bring up uh, documentary films is my um, husband and I have a weekly film review program on Spokane Public Radio, and so I'm uh, very, um, I guess, committed to the notion that documentaries and popular culture can make us aware of some issues or problems or concerns that we uh, might not otherwise consider. Um, so there's been some awareness that these are problems. Um, also, interestingly enough, um, the medical community in, has really jumped on board here uh, just in the relative recent past looking at uh, 
there's some assessment that can be done by physicians, healthcare providers, and doctors. Because as Jamie indicated, there are many points at which we might be able to catch um, or link or acknowledge uh, the fact that children who are immigrating to this country have mental health issues or mental health needs. Uh, and with all of the shifts in sort of immigration reform, and that's another thing I would say, as we talk about immigration reform, we need to be mindful of some of these other side issues that sometimes go missing. Um, there is now an Office of Refugee Resettlement that does require children to be screened by physicians um, within uh, a very short period, sometimes within 24 hours of their arrival. Well, part of the problem is that gen general practitioners in particular don't always or necessarily, with the language difficulties and so forth and so on, recognize some of the mental health uh, issues. So I think doctors are becoming aware of the fact that they have a particular gatekeeping function um, in identifying these particular issues and problems. Um, I think also, as Jamie mentioned, the uh, appointment of legal counsel uh, at the earliest possible point. And keep in mind, some of these kids come to the border and they're just dealt with with Customs and Border Patrol agents. So they never even make it into the next stage of the process. So they're immediately or are very within short proximity returned to their home countries. So we may not be able to uh, necessarily um, uh, have anything to do with that population group, but if you're going to remain in the United States, uh, and whether it's for placement, unfortunately, in a detention facility, which happens to some of these children, um, whether it's in foster care, the fact that we don't have a specialized foster care system for dealing with um, children who have men mental health uh, issues is an ongoing problem. So I guess the point that I'm making, at least in part, is that there are opportunities for several potential gatekeepers um, to address and identify um, these particular mental health needs. Um, also, as Michael pointed out, um, we do have an international connection here because there are uh, international laws that pertain to refugees. Certainly, we would like to believe that even though the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and I should add, Michael, that South Sudan um, has not yet ratified oh. either, but they that are... That makes me feel so much better, Mary. But they have uh, made further steps than have we in the United States toward that ratification process. But nevertheless, that, along with the convention, um, the CRPD, I mean, I think these are other opportunities for us to look at uh, the mental health needs of children uh, from an international perspective as well. And so then um, uh, I just wanted Jamie to take uh, a minute or two and explain what's uh, going on with respect to at least getting attorneys involved in this process as gatekeepers, um, because I think that there has been some movement. Uh, Diane Feinstein, uh, 12 years ago, introduced a bill that would make it a requirement for um, unaccompanied children to have attorneys appointed to represent them at the earliest possible point and certainly at the time of removal proceedings. Um, and even though some of the uh, focus in that particular act uh, was implemented into the <coughs> Trafficking um, Victims Protection Reauthorization Act in 2008, it still has not come to fruition in the form uh, that I think uh, Senator Feinstein intended and probably is necessary for um, adequate uh, representation and uh, gatekeeping on some of the health and mental health related issues. So just quickly um, to wrap up, but there's been a little bit of, um, there's, well, since 99, there's been a sort of legislative movement and several efforts as <coughs> Professor Truthart indicated, Senator Feinstein has introduced a bill on several occasions, but most recently last year, um, Senate Bill 744, which was the so-called comprehensive immigration reform bill um, that the Senate passed actually contains um, a statutory right to counsel for um, all children uh, in immigration proceedings, which is significant and uh, wonderful progress from my perspective. Now, whether uh, it would get through the House of Representatives um, is another matter, but the Senate um, several times has has um, passed this, so and it's been making um, incremental steps, so we'll see what happens there. And actually, 744 of the Senate bill also includes a statutory right to counsel for persons with uh, mental disabilities and mental health needs that are um, in deportation proceedings. So that also is very significant and whether it could pass the House um, might be an, another matter, but we're um, hopeful that that may occur. So quickly, I just wanted to highlight, and please come see me afterwards or if you have questions, um, 
but we have a wonderful um, organization here in Seattle doing this work. Um, as uh, Professor Truthart indicated, KIND, Kids in Need of Defense, is a, um, a national organization that has an office in Seattle, and it used to be called, you may have heard of BEIGE, Volunteer Advocates for Immigrant Justice, um, which was started by the ABA Commission on Immigration, and, um, but uh, KIND started um, just a handful of years ago with money from Microsoft and Angelina Jolie actually um, doing this, this great work to train and recruit and provide free legal representation for these immigrant children. And here in Seattle we now have a KIND office which is really exciting and Julianne Bildauer is phenomenal and she is the director and runs the KIND office here and provides free training and free CLEs so for anyone who's interested and wants to get involved there are children being detained right now and to Coma um, that could use your um, your legal skills and to have a voice, um, which would be phenomenal. So, and then there's some other legislative advocacy and, and other ABA projects that that we're working on. Um, if you're interested, please um, feel free to ask. Thank you. Thank you. Play when I need it. Great. Well, thank you. Um, I really appreciate being asked to be here today. I um, got to work with Paul a little bit um, and on some youth-related, children-related issues. And I'm going to talk about some different children-related issues today. But one thing I, uh, the first thing I ever worked on with him, um, and which has really stuck with me, is um, in Washington State, we had um, a state Supreme Court decision come down that um, changed the state definition of disability to be much narrower than it used to be and make it as narrow as the ADA definition of disability um, had been at that time. And um, he came down to support a group of students from the school who heard about this issue and wanted to work with me and some other folks who were working on getting that state Supreme Court decision overturned. And a couple months later, the legislature overturned that state Supreme Court decision by saying, no, we meant we wanted a really broad definition and we wanted to protect um, as many people as possible from discrimination. And um, what I really took away from that meeting was his connection to being a mentor. He was, um, you know, I, he was a rock star in my eyes um, from when I first met him and the little bit I got to work with him. And, um, but he always treated everyone he worked with with great amount of respect and never talked down to me, although he certainly could have if he wanted and I wouldn't have objected. Um, and um, I think that's really important, um, that mentoring, that um, being ready to help um, everyone else wants to help in your same direction. And um, I'm going to show you a video here of a young advocate who, um, when we first met, I, um, I first met her um, in an inpatient setting. And um, she was not doing well and was not feeling like a strong advocate. Five years later, she is a strong advocate, and you'll hear from her, and you'll hear a little bit about what she and the nine other youth who stood up with her to fight against the, the system they were seeing and deal with some of the criminalization that Michael was talking about of their mental health issues. Um, you'll kind of see the, the, what, the new world that we're trying to create in the next five years. I was involved with law enforcement a lot. I, I uh, was mostly ending up in, in the back of police cars and t being taken to juvie and um, wasn't really getting the mental health treatment that I needed. I don't even know how to be a, reg a regular kid anymore because um, treatment, they just lock you up in there and you, 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 you're used to not being around the community. Youth with mental illness can excel when they get the right treatment. When they can't get adequate treatment, youth risk cycling in and out of foster care, hospitalization, inpatient programs, and juvenile justice facilities. I was really angry as a kid. And I thought I, I was big and bad, all that. I hated the medication. They didn't even ask me what was going on with me. They just put a med on me. 
getting out and letting kids be with other kids and giving them responsibility, interacting in general in the community just helps. It helps you find jobs and it helps you find friends, of course, and just things to do to keep you busy and healthy. Tina stood up along with nine other youth across Washington to represent the thousands of people under 21 in Washington who use Medicaid insurance and need intensive in-home mental health services. They filed a lawsuit called TR versus Quigley. In this class action lawsuit, the youth asked the state to create a system that will deliver intensive in-home services in order to help them stay at home. This way, youth with mental illness who need intensive services can recover in their own neighborhoods with their own families and friends. Attorneys for the youth and representatives for the state of Washington have been developing plans to deliver these services and negotiating a settlement for the past few years. And now, an agreement has been reached. The ending is uh, uh, Tina, who's doing the voiceover, um, and she's sitting in the back, um, could tell you that uh, a judge is going to review the plan and see if it was fair, reasonable, and adequate. And on December 19th, the judge reviewed it and said, not only is it fair, reasonable, and adequate, but it's a landmark decision that'll, that a landmark settlement that will uh, provide incredible uh, results in, for the youth. Um, what, and, um, and I'm gonna talk about three things very quickly um, that went into getting us there. Um, first and foremost, as, as I started this, we got there because Tina and nine other youth like Tina, who were not in a position of power, were willing to trust us enough to, when we said, we can show you how to move to a position of power, um, they said they'd like to go along for the ride. And, um, and Tina now is on an advisory panel that is designing the rollout of the services that will now be delivered. By the time they are delivered in her area, Tina will be too old to get them. Um, Tina started this when she was 14. Um, they will actually, I just saw the chart of when they'll roll out. They'll probably roll out right when she turns 21 in her, her area. But she's known all along. I'm in this for everybody else. And, um, but the three things I want to talk about is investigations, education, and advocacy. Um, those happen to be three things that my office is mandated to do by Congress. Every state and territory has to have an office like mine to do investigations, to educate people and inform them about their rights, and then to do advocacy about those rights. And all of that, that multimodal approach, goes into a case like this. Um, so first and foremost, the investigations. What did we find? Well, how did we start all of this? I guess they said I can go rogue, you turn on my mic here, can y'all hear me with this? Okay, great. Um, so first and foremost, we saw a problem. There were lots of kids in institutional placements. Um, institutional being the state psychiatric hospital for youth and other long-term inpatient placements and in juvenile justice settings. Um, and those systems were really clogged up and there's a long waiting list to get into them. A lot of people's first reaction, there's a long waiting list for something, is, well, let's get more of those services so that there isn't a waiting list anymore. But is that really what we want, is to be funneling more kids into the juvenile justice system and more kids into inpatient psychiatric services? Um, so we started to investigate the root cause of this wait list and found that there were um, inadequate home services for youth. Often what youth would see is, well, we can give you medication, and if you want to come into a therapist once a week and talk to us about your problems, I suppose we can hook you up with that too. It might take a little bit of hoops to jump through, but we'll get you that. Now, I don't know about you, I have a hard time bottling up all my, my anxieties and, and frustrations um, throughout the day. And I'm a relatively well-adjusted adult who doesn't have a mental illness. I can't imagine being 12, um, having post-traumatic stress disorder from being abused as a child, and having an anxiety um, condition that isn't yet um, fully understood by the clinicians in my life, 
and them just saying, well, let's give you some more meds. And once a week, you can come in and tell us what's going on. And we'll tell you things to do throughout the next week when you're at school, when you're at home, when you're with your friends and uh, at the park. And you'll apply what you learn that one day, you know, one hour in our, in our um, office to what's going on there. And that's the most we can do. If that doesn't work for you, you end up hitting someone at school, we'll have to arrest you and put you into juvie. Or, um, you know, if things get really bad, I suppose we can find a spot for you in the state psychiatric hospital and put you on that waiting list. Those didn't seem like adequate responses. Uh, we talked to experts, we talked to families, what would actually work here, and intensive in-home services is what would work. So um, we then had to educate people about, there's this law that says not only would it be nice if you got the services you need, but there is a thing called EPSDT. It's a, an element of Medicaid and just put simply, it says if you are under 21, you use Medicaid as insurance, you need a service, you have medical necessity for it, you get it. It's not like the adult system where you can put lots of different caps and play games with how you can get the services and try and limit it. But if you need it, you get it. And we had to educate people. Families didn't know this. They didn't know, oh, I can stand up and I have already have an entitlement that Congress has created years and years and years ago. Um, providers didn't know it. They've heard of EPSDT, but they didn't know that we could make that a reality. If I think that a kid needs a service like in-home therapy, we can come out throughout the week in real time um, in your milieu, see how things are going. You know, what sets you off? What sets your parents off? What's going on at school? We can have the therapist there with you in real time, not just one hour a week, but several hours each day. Or if something goes on at 2 o'clock in the morning, the new system, the new plan we have in place will not only deliver those intensive services throughout the week that will help you in your own home, but if something happens at 2 o'clock in the morning, you get really frustrated and, um, you're, or you're really anxious and you need to call someone on your treatment team, there is someone on call from your treatment team or someone closely related to your treatment team, someone who works with them. Someone who's familiar with you and you're familiar with them is available 24-7. So if you need them, they will not just talk to you on the phone, but come out to your house and work with you. These really intensive services that in the past we had thought this is only possible if we put the individual in a, in a psychiatric setting long term. Um, now we are moving those services out to the community because you don't need those services every day. You might need those services once in a while. And those really intensive services will be brought to you in real time when you need them once in a while in your home. But you can, as Tina was saying, Stay connected with your family, your friends, your school, because that's the support network that's going to really help you through this in the long term and allow you to maintain your connections. And then finally is the advocacy. And with the advocacy, um, really seems like an afterthought. After you've done all the investigation, that takes a couple of years. Um, you educate people about these are the things you could have if you, um, if you enforced your rights and them trusting you enough to try to um, push the system to get them and have doctors write letters they know will never be fulfilled, but at least they're creating a paper trail showing, I said I think it would be in their best interest to get this, and they're not getting it. Um, finally, we get to the advocacy portion. And in the advocacy, there's a lot of work, and so we need to build all of those facts I just talked about. We need to build an advocacy team, because in this particular case, um, again, it took over five years to get to this point, over 12,000 attorney hours, um, over $200,000 of out-of-pocket costs from the, um, attorney, the co counsel in the case, and ultimately it ends up in a plan that is just for injunctive relief, which means the state will have to do something now, it has changed its system, but that change is only going to start happening now, and people are going to start realizing it now, and it will roll out over the next five years. So as I said, um, Tina will not see the realization in her time of actually receiving the services, but she knew that it takes a long time to build that and that she needs to um, be that person who can mentor the next group along. She sees herself as a, as a strong advocate now, and I, I am glad she sees herself as a strong advocate, but what I also see her as is a strong mentor, because when she talks to other people, she tries to talk them into being advocates as well. So um, this is um, a, a, a big change for an individual person like Tina, um, but it's also 
um, going to be a very big change for the system and hopefully a big change for those tens of thousands of youth who in the future will be using the system, Tina and her um, other plaintiffs helped set up. So thank you. I want to thank all of the panelists for their contribution to this discussion. I want to continue a, a, that theme and something that came from this morning about this notion of the importance of an alliance because I think we have some contradictory messages here. Um, it used to be that the disability really was Apple Pie, disability legal services, as in the P&A system, which has been around since the 70s, I believe, was Apple Pie, bipartisan, like the ADA itself, uh, not subject to the numerous restrictions which are faced by our other civil legal services programs, whether it was on abortion, uh, whether it was on uh, gay rights, whether it was on prison reform, welfare reform, class actions, all the rest of it, which Congress gutted over the years in response to individual legislators, P&A has usually been apple pie, totally supported, not having funding cuts, but now we're seeing some trouble in the system. So one is to talk about this notion, not simply of needing to bring the various disability communities together, intellectual, mental health, uh, communication, sensory, physical, so forth, but what about the other allies? We had talks about that this morning, about the importance of working with other marginalized uh, communities. So uh, maybe some thoughts on that first and then, and then I'll go into some other areas if anyone wants to re respond to that. Um, I've never met a question that I didn't want to answer, you know, so I'll take that. Uh, and I'm going to start out with you something. Have a, you, need a do you need a Bob Dylan theme to go with it. There's always a Bob Dylan theme. Yeah, keep, my Bob Dylan theme for this is from uh, Tangled Up in Blue. we got to keep on keeping on. I mean, that's, that's it in five words. Uh, here's something which is going to sound incredibly self-referential, but you know that's me. Uh, the original, the PNA system, flowed from the Mental Health Systems Act, which was enacted before it that got cut in a Ronald Reagan budget cut in the early 1980s. That was based on the New Jersey Division of Mental Health Advocacy, which I directed. Congressman Jim Florio wrote this bill and it eventually passed, and it was basically the idea was at that time for every state under federal funding to have an office like ours was, which was to provide independent advocacy, legal and other. And somebody mentioned earlier working with non-lawyers when we set our office up. 50% uh, were lawyers, 50% were others, which included mental health professionals and, and advocates. Uh, the PNA system grew after that was abolished. It was the next sort of next thing up. Uh, the PNAs have been, you know, they're, they're frankly, I mean, in, in, and I've done some work on them over the years. They are not all, frankly, like David's office or the offices in California, New Jersey, New York. I've been to some that have left my hair even grayer than it is, as if you would think that is possible. And I think that's important to point out that in some, you know, one, one PNA director told me that she believed if she had tea with the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, it would do more than all of my foolish lawsuits put together. Another PNA director told me the only thing we should ever do is support medical malpractice cases, etc. I have a lot of stories like that. Uh, but the ones that are good, and generally the ones that are good are great, and also generally come from states where there was an advocacy ethos before they were created, almost invariably. Uh, they also, I mean, unfortunately, often depend on a few stars, a few people in certain states who are willing to work 28 hours a day, eight days a week, and that makes these offices great, and that's always, you know, problematic. Uh, the whole notion of coalitions is really, I, I, I will give up the microphone after this, I promise. There's really two sort of separate issues to think about. One, uh, when Michael McCann talked about Frank Munger's book, and Frank is a colleague of mine, uh, saying that people they interviewed with disabilities were very uncomfortable sort of seeing themselves like a civil rights movement, especially uh, Caucasian people sort of rejecting the notion of an African-American civil rights movement is very troubling, was troubling when Frank wrote the book. I simply have no idea whether or not, the book is at least 10 years old, whether or not there's been a change, and Michael could probably tell me that. But the other issue, and I told Andy at one of the breaks I was going to ask him this, so I might as well throw it out now. There has been all of, virtually all, disability rights groups are totally on board, all in on the convention, except for 
some of the groups of persons who have been psychiatrically institutionalized. Uh, uh, David, uh, Andy mentioned the World Users Network, Psych Rights, a couple of others. And again, as I, I said jokingly, all I know, I know from Facebook and Twitter, but it's a pretty good way of sort of finding out, you know, which way winds are blowing. Uh, and I've seen so many posts recently saying, if there are any RUDs, those are reservations, the U.S. should not sign, they should not ratify the treaty. These are people who have been institutionalized with mental disabilities in the past who believe that anything other than a perfect treaty, it's better not to have any. I disagree profoundly. Mary, if you're tweeting this, you can, you know, this is going to cause me a lot of service, but, you know, you can put it on. I don't care. I think they are totally wrong about this. I think it is why the left self-immolated in the 30s, and I'm really very exercised about it. My question to Andy is, there is a question at the end of this rant, is how serious is this other than people posting and talking to each other? Andy, go ahead. And you don't need a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. You did get that. Okay, we don't have a... That was easy. We don't have a Yiddish-English interpreter, so Soros is, is, is worries. Andy, go ahead. So I guess I'll try to answer that your narrow question at the end. How, how serious a threat is the fact that there are some groups and leaders in the, the mental health disability world who would prefer not to ratify the treaty if it has to have the reservations, understandings, and declarations that are currently attached to it. I don't think that is the thing that will prevent the treaty from getting ratified. That, that message has not broken through. One of the witnesses that was against the treaty tried to use the arguments that were being made there to say that there are some in the disability world who are going to try to use the treaty to change laws, and that didn't seem to get any traction, and, and there weren't any senators that followed up and asked questions. So the bigger problem for me is that anytime there's disunity in the disability community, um, it, it takes energy and, and it oftentimes creates schisms that outlast whatever the issue that, that created the disunity. And I, my approach to legislative advocacy is kind of a community organizing approach. To me, it's more important at the end of a legislative campaign that the community is stronger and better informed with better relationships than that we actually won the campaign. So um, to the extent that there's, there's a problem or a schism within our field or our movement, I, I'd like to, to see more of an effort to, to bridge it. Um, and I'm not saying that those efforts haven't occurred because they have. There are important leaders in the mental health consumer survivor world like Dan Fisher, David Oaks, and others who are very supportive of ratification. So it's not like there, there are even divides within you know the, the mental health world. But going back to the PNA question, if I can, and, and um, I th I think that the the origins of the PNA network, which has expanded in a lot of ways, thanks to you know good advocacy by Kurt Decker and, and his team at, at what's now called NDRN, used to be called NAPAS. Um, but the origins really started with the DD Act and Eunice Kennedy Shriver and John Kennedy, you know, kind of championed and owned by Ted Kennedy and Tom Harkin, and. You know, Senator Harkin's retiring at the end of this year. And so I feel like the opportunity for the field is to have a refresh about we created these networks, you know, uh, in the 60s when there was a need for literally protection and advocacy in institutions. There still is a need for that, but there's also a need for a lot of other types of, of advocacy work. And I think that. That conversation with new champions, new Democrat and Republican champions, is going to be an important thing to do. I think the, the 25th anniversary of the ADA next year, 40th anniversary of the special education law, create an opportunity for us to have a refresh in general in terms of what is the disability agenda moving forward, where have we made progress, where are we still stuck. Certainly the panel on juvenile justice was illustrative of one of the areas where we clearly have a lot of room for improvement, but so I, I don't know where all that will lead, but I, but I feel like we've had the luxury of the Ted Kennedys, the Bob Doles, people that 
they didn't need to be convinced uh, in terms of the value of lives of people with disabilities and didn't need to be convinced in terms of the value of lawyers and advocacy and a lot of things that we used to take for granted we can't that's scary everybody feels vulnerable in this situation but it's also an opportunity to re-educate a new generation of legislators what is the role of lawyers here how do the federal dollars get leveraged to the extent that the lawyers get attorney's fees how do those get churned back into the program I just think there, there are things about the business model that need to get explained again to, to Congress. The only other thing I'll say, and, and I know this may, um, this may be controversial, but I feel like too much of our movement is funded by the government. So if, if you travel around the country, uh, the independent living centers oftentimes are the places that I go to find disabled people in leadership trying to make things happen. They, to a large part, are funded by the federal government and the state government in some states. The protection and advocacy agencies still, to a large degree, heavily rely on federal funding. There are some that are entrepreneurial that have gone out and found other funding sources, but to a large degree, they're heavily, the, the university centers for excellence are good at leveraging their core grants, but a lot of the other money they're getting is also public money. And I feel like as a movement, we have to find a way to fund ourselves in a way that we can take on the government and win and not feel like we're at risk of losing our funding. Um, so that's, to me, that's buried in your question. If we're gonna fund kind of the legal arm of our movement with government money, the, the legal arm of our movement is vulnerable when the government doesn't like us. Yeah, we could spend a whole seminar on that. I know, Arlene, did you want to say something? Then I want to get back to Michael McCann on this whole, the, back to the Munger uh, angle book. Were you gonna say something? Or maybe I misread you. Yeah, I, I think it was related. Oh. I, was going to say that. I, know it's I wanted to just reflect a minute on this kind of to call out this divide that we're seeing and to just say that we have to live within it. What's the divide? I came out when the, uh, we had a conversation in 1998 in Washington, D.C. about developing a CRPD with women's rights people who had gone through CEDAW talking about a convention for the rights of people with disabilities. Small group, started thinking about it. And I remember I left that meeting and ended up writing an editorial, I think, in our local paper against the idea of a human rights treaty for people with disabilities, me, right? Because why should we have a separate treaty for women, for kids, people with disabilities? We're moving in the wrong direction. We need the application and enforcement of existing human rights treaties for all. Well, fast forward, right? I come out with an editorial not far later in support of and spend a lot of my hours working for this specialized convention. And this is the divide I just want to call out. We live in a world where we have to have P&As, we have to have a CRPD, we have to have, quote, special laws, different laws, focused laws and protections for individual groups, because if not, those groups are generally have been left behind. On the other hand, what do I spend a lot of my time now doing is trying to figure out ways to infiltrate, infuse, I like the word infiltrate, actually, infuse, <laughs> issues of disability rights and advocacy into non-disability rights and advocacy causes, quote, mainstream, cause other. So women, I just spent four days in Washington on a project looking at how we can introduce this notion and this prevalence of violence against women with disabilities around the world to existing women's rights organizations who totally ignore the issue, as well as disability rights organizations who marginalize the issue. On the issue of immigration, I was just going to say also that I, don't, I wanted to talk to them afterwards, but I remember I brought the first case to the Board of Immigration Appeals, arguing that people with disabilities should be a protected group, and that to return them to their country is no different if they were part of a political minority who could be tortured and put to death, if they're returned to an institution as a person with a disability and could end up dead to try to infiltrate this immigration conversations about the risks of people with disabilities who return to the country. I can give you, you know what I'm going to say, kids with disabilities who are in institutions for foster care children, we have permanency planning requirements that the plan has to be for a kid to return to a family. Yet kids can remain in institutions without any planning to ever return to a family. So. The challenge we're all, I, I feel, that we're living in constantly is between this specialized advocacy and trying to infiltrate mainstream advocacy. 
And it's not an easy task, but the good thing is that our numbers are growing. I think that what, I mean, Michael, we're old timers, you're too young, but I mean, in our lifetime, there has never been the numbers of courses. I mean, you're saying there aren't many. I'm saying, oh my God, so many schools have these courses. So many students are graduating. So many human rights activists and women's rights activists know about disability issues in a way that they didn't before. Yeah, no, and the ghettoization point, I think, is, is well taken, and I think it goes both ways. There's the broader civil rights, human rights community, which may be ignorant, uninformed, and at the same time, I've seen sometimes from the disability community a certain uh, parochialism in, in, in its approach, ne never mind the, 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 the schisms within the community. Um, Michael, to you, the other Michael, on the um, question of um, if you know anything about the update of the um, Munger Engel book, but but more to the point, I thought it was interesting what you said. It was very fascinating. This notion of um, at the grassroots, these concepts are not known, at least in the global global north, or based on that experience. And yet, isn't it true of other uh, civil rights e equality movements where it takes? It's not at the grassroots where you have necessarily affiliation and the understanding, but it takes sort of a mid level or upper level elite, if you will, activist to do the enforcement, at least at the initial stages, to take those steps, and later it sort of trickles down, if you will. So I'm not sure it's different in disability than the people who sat at the lunch counters, the people who got on the buses. You know, if you talked again to, to blacks in the South about their identity and what they were willing to do, I'm not sure you'd see that same level of activism. So I'm kind of throwing out a lot of things there, but you want to pick up on any of that. A lot of things. Um, I certainly think that intermediary organizations, associations, connections, networks are really the, cr the critical key. To, to expect some sort of spontaneous outburst from the bottom, that's almost never how social change happens. At certain moments that happens, but there's been a lot of ground that's been prepared for that, and leaders of various sorts happen. They don't necessarily have to be technocrats, lawyers, specialists, and so forth. I mean, uh, comes out of churches and, uh, a lot of times and so forth. Um, so we're just thinking about social change. It, there's two things I can say. One was there was this question about whether the, the study that I'd mentioned, Engel and Munger, and there were a lot of other studies about various other groups that experienced discrimination and, and whether they, the, the willingness or conversely the reluctance of people to claim rights at the point of discrimination uh, in the 90s. And since then, I don't know of any studies that have replicated what Engel and Munger done, and both of them are now studying Thailand on different issues. So, uh, although I talk to David a lot, and they have continued to interact with various disability rights groups and so forth, and have often, um, I think, been dismayed because people didn't want to believe what they found. Uh, but I understand because it's kind of depressing in a certain way. It doesn't help you sort of marshal your energies to, to, to read what they found. But it is very consistent with what we know with the studies of lots of ordinary people that are not affiliated without support groups and are in connection with activists and, and also facing what had been mentioned earlier, you know, to, to take action is often to, to you know, to, it's a prospect of committing several years of your life to bureaucratic nightmares that really challenge existing practices and relationships and acts of discrimination and so forth. And that's very daunting. And that's part of why I think individuals are often reluctant and conflicted about um, claiming rights and, and naming injustices and so forth. The other thing that I'd mention about all this though, I think that one of the dilemmas for disability rights is in all rights, and, and this is true in national government, state government, really has to do with big business because the whole specter of stigmatizing rights claiming and litigation, anything, you know, the big business doesn't like, it says that's a, that's a bill for lawyers. You know, in this sort of hostility to litigation, I wrote a book looking at 25 years of newspaper coverage about civil litigation of all sorts. And the media jumped totally on, you know, lampooning and making fun of anybody who files a lawsuit against corporations, a frivolous lawsuit. And big business was spending hundreds of millions of dollars for a long period of time to sort of pollute the public culture about litigation and lawyers, about individuals. And the media picked up on that for a whole variety of reasons, not directly out of influence, but because it made for good and funny news. Um, and so there's a context there. Now that has that kind of stigmatization of people challenging power and, and challenging discrimination is not quite so prevalent now, not quite so front and center. But I think that that's part of the exhaustion with rights is that it isn't just 
well, rights didn't deliver, you know, civil rights for groups didn't deliver, it's also that they have been stigmatized by very conservative activity. You know, a public sector that has been saturated with these images that are very hostile to lawyers, to plaintiffs, and to rights talk. And, and I think that the, the question is, and, and the interesting thing is that a, a lot of, we didn't specifically code our newspaper articles to isolate um, uh, disabilities litigation, disabilities rights from other kinds of civil rights, but I know because we read all the articles, about 8,000 articles, um, and saw the coding of them, that, uh, that disabilities in particular was identified with frivolous litigation, is unjustified litigation, you know, uh, unwarranted litigation, excessive litigation, all those kinds of things. And whether there's a, you know, whether that, how much that still is part polluting the kind of struggle for disability rights, I don't really know. And if I may, on that point, I think we certainly saw in the California legislature, maybe elsewhere, there is pushback. Uh, the, 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 the criticism of the so-called drive-by lawsuit. Um, uh, lawyers and or litigants who are um, greedy, uh, even though clearly under the ADA and parallel state legislation, the enforcement was meant to go to the individual with the financial incentives there, sometimes just injunctive relief and not damages, but criticism of these lawsuits that were supposedly frivolous and, and, and not genuine. I would also say that in the human rights sphere, where there's a burgeoning movement now of, uh, and, and Arlene and I were just talking about this at break, about going after businesses and corporate entities as well as government, those corporations are definitely pushing back with public relations campaigns, not simply their litigation defense. But I'll ask if oh, the other I just say, oh, my sure. point about that is I just think that that has to be kept in mind in making the case for support for passing new laws, for new mechanisms of release and so forth. Re, you know, I think the presumption should be that there's a hostile audience there and how do you talk around that? Just like any rights kind of issue, recognize that there's a presumption that there's, there's a way in which all these rights are no, not considered equal rights or special rights and the litigants are not really uh, deserving and that the lawyers are just out to make a buck. All that kind of stuff just pollutes it and so it has to be talked around, addressed, presumed and everything. I don't know which comes first, the media or the courts, but the courts have perpetuated this view, right? First through the very narrow interpretation of who's a person with disability that was remedied by Congress, but also if you look at a lot of cases over around standing for people who can bring Title III claims, claims for discrimination by public entity, private public accommodations. We just lost a case, um, not we, but in the clinic in our law school, of a woman who lived in a town that was a historic town, she has a mobility impairment. She couldn't enter a particular store. She sued. And the court said she didn't have standing because she had never really actually tried to go into the store, although she couldn't go into the store because there was a step in front of the store and she couldn't get into the store, although she lived in that community. And they're using these standing and neutral jurisprudential um, um, doctrines to prevent remedies, even in some valid cases that are coming to court. So it's the media and the court, some very conservative judges who are promoting these views. Uh, I wrote an article recently, I can start a lot of sentences like that, <laughs> uh, with my colleague Heather Ellis Cucolo about how the press has influenced uh, decisions in cases involving sex offenders in jurisdictions where judges are elected much more than appointed. And uh, I, I looked at the literature on punitive damages and there's been an awful lot of studies of that and it seems fairly clear that court decisions changed after media changed. In other words, the media, it was, and you know, the action news, and now look at the silly case that was brought by. It was the impact of what, and I, you know, of the vividness heuristic, you know, that cognitive simplifying device where we take one negative example and it outweighs hundreds of pages of valid, sober, reliable research. But the, the research, and I'm not, I'm not an expert on punitive damages at all, the research that was done seemed to me to be crystal clear that it was only after the media jumped on board that the courts changed their opinions. And I, what we found in sex offenders, obviously a much more controversial area, was exactly the same thing. Uh, there, is, there is now an article going around uh, the P&As, and it was sent to me, by my former research assistant, uh, who's now with Disability Rights of New Jersey, involving a case in Maine in which somebody was released from a hospital and committed a criminal act afterwards. And this is apparently, again, this one case, this fell between the cracks case, is going to be part of this 
you know, Murphy slash Tory argument to dismantle the PNAs. I think we have to be aware of that. And I think we have to be aware of the media's potential power. I always, my dad, may he rest in peace, was a newspaper man. I've always had a wonderful relationship with the media. I'm always happy to be interviewed. And I think we as a cohort don't always do that well. And I think we need to. I think we need to make our cases effectively, soberly, and, and clearly. And I think we will reap the benefit of that for the rest of our work. I, I want to come back to um, yeah, the, the, the resource issue. And certainly, Andy, you alluded to this in terms of uh, a debate which other advocacy groups have had. If we take government money, then our hands will be tied. And, and yet, we heard in a number of the panels this morning, we, we all know this intuitively, that so much of what is needed, not simply from an advocacy standpoint, from a support and service standpoint, is money. And so then to kind of take that source away, <laughs> there's one source there that, 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 could, that, that could be utilized. What is the answer uh, for, for realizing a lot of the, the rights and integration that we're talking about, the true integration into society or into schools, into public transit, into businesses, if we don't have the financial resources there. We can't all be left to volunteerism and 28 hours a day. Any thoughts on that? Well, you know, I want to be clear. I, to me, the, there's value in having diverse funding sources so that if one disappears, the whole operation doesn't go belly up. And, and so my concern is that not every entity that receives federal funding has even been encouraged by their federal funding source. In some cases, they're discouraged to go out and raise money from other sources. And, and I think from a sustainability standpoint, the, the institutions that are most important to our movement need to have diverse funding in order for our movement to be sustainable. There's always going to be a hostile administration at some point. Um, Kansas has one of the strongest disability communities in the country, and Governor Brownback has done a number on the advocates in Kansas, and they're a lot weaker now than they were when he came into office. So I just, that's what I'm saying. I'm not saying we should- Not don't take the money, just right. beware other sources. And try to be entrepreneurial and recognize that you have to be prepared for worst case scenario. When people call me and ask me for a, a referral, I get calls all the time. You know, Professor Pearl, and I know you're not representing people, but who can you send me to? In the city of New York with 8 million people, which means there's probably 7 million lawyers, right? I have two people. Two people in private practice doing mental disability law who I trust. In New Jersey, there's also two people, different two people. Arlene, I mean, let's, we, we could sit and talk about it. How many people are there of our generation who went into mental disability law practice in private practice and have been made a decent living of it? David Froh or who else? Okay, I mean, we, we could, now more. No, putting aside special ed, but in terms of the kinds of things that Arlene and I have devoted our careers to, and that David is devoting his career to, David is devoting his career to, uh, I think there's probably fewer than 10 people in the United States. And that's really scary on a whole lot of levels. So I think this whole question about we take government money or not, if there is no government funded advocacy, I believe everything would collapse. And I hate saying that. Am I being too pessimistic? No, but I'm an optimist, so I think there will continue to be government funding, and we have to look for yeah. other sources. Yeah. What if I can transition a bit uh, back to the convention? And I think uh, Andy uh, alluded to this in his remarks earlier that you know this effort to sell the convention, which now is in round two or three, depending on how long you think, about, to our own uh, Senate. Do we not in that process uh, by saying, "Oh, it's so innocent, it's so inoffensive." Um, don't worry, it won't change anything, and, and, and he says much today. Um, and if it's all in the end just about branding, and I've read the, you know, the analysis from the State Department and positions, and I can say this, uh, I'm sure uh, Judy Human's staff as well, has to be about, you know, this is putting the American seal of approval on it. Is there anything more when the end, the end of the day, when it's in, in the basket, maybe, um, what will it mean for us, if, if, particularly with the reservations and the understandings and, 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 and declarations, what will it mean for us in the end if it's, if it's ratified, other than window dressing and the symbolic importance of the U.S. putting its seal of approval on it? Well, anyone can answer that. I, you know, I'll start, and then I think other folks will have 
I think, strong answers to that. From from my perspective, I, I like when Senator Harkin testified in front of the Foreign Relations Committee in the last Congress. At the end of his testimony, he said that the convention would have no fiscal impact, but that it would have a moral impact. And he talked about it, I think of it in kind of a witness sense. He said, this is America saying that it's not okay for children with disabilities to be locked up in institutions. This is America saying it's not okay for the things that we heard Arlene talk about um, going on around the world. And that's America at its best. So branding may sound conservative, corporate, whatever, but the idea is what do we stand for as a country? Um, and I, to me, I also think it's not insignificant if we do become a party to this convention that we may start to become parties to other conventions. This could be breaking a logjam that has existed for a while in terms of these types of conventions. And I think that's part of the reason why the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights and women's groups and LGBT groups and others are strongly supporting ratification of the convention. So I think it's a big deal. I, you know, What's it going to mean for a kid in a classroom in Seattle? I don't know. But I also think at this moment where we're refreshing our agenda 25 years into ADA, it's a nice frame. You know, you can hang whatever you want off of that frame and you don't have to say that we have to pass this law because we're now a party to the convention, but you say this law will, will move America forward in a way that's consistent with the convention and, and help us maintain our leadership role in the world on this particular issue, like a guardianship issue. You don't have to say that the convention requires us to do this. You could say this is consistent with the convention and it's good policy, so let's do it. And, and I want to come back to that uh, school, uh, that student in Seattle in a minute. By the way, I was interesting you talked about the irony of a, a lame duck Congress approving the convention. Is that, is that, is that politically safe? Or maybe, maybe it's appropriate that it be a lame duck Congress that does it. Am I being too subtle? Okay. Um, the, the school, anyone want to comment on that? I, I actually have a question for Andy. As of today, what are the RUDs yeah, that you would expect? Question. And remember, it's, reservations, understandings, and I apologize for the short, you kill me. And right say now. something, before you ask the question, explain as you understand those terms, or maybe Andy can, and then go ahead with the question. So, the, the reservations, understandings, and declarations that were sent up by the Obama administration to the Senate uh, had boilerplate language that would come up with any UN convention. It's things like a federalism reservation that we're not going to somehow take away a right from a state that they would have under U.S. concepts of federalism. You know, there, there, are, there are a lot of reservations that are like that. I think there was one kind of disability specific reservation that talked about our understanding of how the definition of disability would apply, would be consistent with U.S. laws, you know, defining disability for different purposes. So I, I didn't see anything radioactive, if you will, in what, what the Obama administration set up. I don't pretend to have inside knowledge on where the Menendez-Corker discussions broke down, but there was a lot of discussion at the hearings about a Supreme Court case where another convention is being used to create a right under the Constitution or, you know, kind of a, a right that the Senate can use to have authority to pass a law. And there's, a, again, it's a concern in conservative circles that somehow um, we're kind of usurping uh, what, what gives Congress authority to act in certain areas. And my guess is, because this is a first impression thing that's in front of the Supreme Court, Corker is asking for something that Menendez and the State Department are not willing to give because, A, they don't think it's necessary. And I thought Menendez did a very good job at the hearing explaining why that case has no relevance to, to this particular convention. But also, they don't want to, again, have to live with that precedent in the context of other, other treaties that come through the committee. So whether that can be resolved, ultimately, I think, is a political question. How much does Corker care? Who's he, hold, who's he carrying water for? How much does Walmart care? <laughs> you know, can, can we get some of the folks that are supporting the convention to start spending some money on it? And can we turn the tide politically? I'm sorry, because you were going to ask me I just wanted to define the terms. Or did no, you? no, I just, just you know, on that, uh, this is something that hasn't been discussed yet. Uh, a judge who unfortunately retired because she was 70 named Kristen Booth Glenn, who was a judge in New York, 
has issued two decisions in her, and one of them was issued on her last day in office, and that was very significant, uh, in which she used the UN Convention uh, to support her decision in two different guardianship cases. One in which the uh, ward's guardian basically stole all his money and never talked to him. The other, I'm, I'm, the facts were not that extreme, but in both cases she said, America has, US has signed the Vienna Convention, and the Vienna Convention says, once the president signs a convention, you have to act in ways that are not contrary to the spirit of Convention 2. And so she endorsed the CRPD. I've written about correctional law in which several circuits have used UN conventions on cases like involving double, like over putting too many inmates in a cell, things of that sort. There are some Massachusetts state cases involving, I can't remember if it's CRC or CEDAW, but under their state law said we are going to use this. So I think the possible creative, I mean this gets my old litigator juice absolutely running into overdrive, that the way of that litigators can use this. And I mean, it's interesting, uh, Andy, when, when this strategy was announced a couple of years ago about, oh, it's going to make no difference, I was appalled because I said, God damn, it's going to make a difference. I want it to make a difference. Every single thing that I talked about today or in the full paper are things that I would want to litigate on behalf of that kid who has to eat his own vomit in Mississippi, right? I would say... This violates the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and ask the judge to enjoin that. I'd like to ask the judge to shoot the warden, but that's a separate issue, you know. <laughs> uh, and I don't believe in the death penalty. Uh, all of the other case articles that I'm working on, on sexuality, on sex offenders, on criminalization of mental illness, on guardianship, in every single area, yes, American law would have to change. Would these cost money or not? One of the most interesting things that none of us mentioned, that the CRPD is one of the very few laws that has both prescriptive and proscriptive rights. And for those who don't know what that means, a proscriptive right is, thou shalt not, thou shalt not torture me. But it also has prescriptive rights. Thou shalt make accommodations. Thou shalt provide educational services, whatever. Thou shalt have community living. It gives you on, it gives you on both sides. Prescriptive rights cost money. Proscriptive rights in the long run don't allow people squawk that they do. But I think the CRPD is a blueprint for good litigators to take it and run. I, I litigated, as I said, for 13 years. I was director of the New Jersey Division for eight. And certainly, I always said, what we're doing, Your Honor, what we're doing is asking the, asking the court to uphold the New Jersey Constitution. Well, it costs the state a lot of money to do that. Hello. This is going to happen. And I think... We are selling ourselves short. I think it's a con job, and I really am troubled by it. That, okay, and, and to follow on that, uh, the kid in Mississippi, the kid in Washington, uh, I want to ask Michael and then Arlene on this point. You, you alluded to this in passing, Michael uh, McCann, about the term special education, and, um, and that would sort of segue into a larger question about, what, about true integration and inclusion. And, and, and Arlene, you talked about the article in the, in, the, in the convention which talks about inclusive education, which is not found in the special ed law, the IDEA, or in any other jurisprudence here. But expound, if you will, a bit on that, Michael, about your objection to that term and what, what its implications might be under the convention. Well, it's a, the connection that, I mean, one of the really powerful stigmatizing uh, sort of frameworks is about special rights. I mean, you speak to that in disabilities rights, there's both the proscriptive, uh, which is, and the, and the prescriptive, the proscriptive about thou shalt not discriminate against, but the prescriptive that need to make accommodations. And that's in almost every kind of discrimination right and other rights, it's those proscriptive because they're said to cost money, or it costs money, but also because they require special treatment in a certain way, right? And that is what is used all the time, one of the favorite tropes of people who want to challenge these things. This isn't equal rights, it's a special rights. It's been used against every group, and, and you know, affirmative action was part of that, quotas, there's all these terms, but they all go under that thing. So. Calling special education one part just politically just evokes that whole sort of image. There's some, it, it, and, and I think that's problematic. I think it's, but it also obviously goes against the sort of logic of inclusion to, to some degree, right? And, but that is the ambiguity of, this, of most equality, it is, is want not to be stigmatized for difference, but you want difference to be recognized for accommodation, right? And, that's, and, and that gives people who want to grow up, you know, be opposed to that, 
lots of resources. It's a very, it's a, and that's, that language is very pervasive. You find it all, that's why I do a lot of coding of newspaper articles and coding of all kinds of things like that to see how much that language comes up. But that's one of the key ways that dominant mainstream groups oppose rights, new rights for various kinds of people, especially in the quality rights. And, I mean, there's a whole point about this is what we need to do is balance quality rights with, with rights as freedom. I mean, freedom, which is a, you know, I think equality is always a paradox. And we can get out of that partly by talking about the empowering, how rights are empowering because they open up possibilities for freedom and creative action. And we're all better off by, by empowering people who have been marginalized in the past. So I, you know, that's one way to get at that. And that. And I want to ask Arlene in a second, but because I, I think this, this, this difficult bridging that Michael Grounder talked about this morning too, about wanting to, needing to give, needing to recognize the difference and to pr provide the support and services and treatment to address it, the interventions, and yet at the same time striving for the true integration inclusion. Arlene, did you want to comment on that or what do you see the potential that, that, that Michael uh, Perlin sees in terms of being able to utilize this convention with its RUDs in place or not, for, for education in particular I, or other areas? I don't have a quick answer. I think it's complicated, so I'll just say this. Um, in part, it'll depend what the final RUDs are. And I think that it's very amorphous here. I think there is a difference, and always has been in DC, between strategy and then implementation. And a strategy to ratify the CRPD is very important. It's a way to educate people about the rights of people with disabilities. And it's important internationally that we are one of the ratifiers. It's embarrassing to go to other countries. Embarrassing to go to other countries. Oh, yeah, why doesn't the United States ratify any treaties? It's embarrassing. Having said that, once it's ratified, I think a lot of good minds will work together to figure out ways that it can be used to enhance our existing rights. And that's kind of where I am right now. So I hope it'll be ratified. I hope the RUDs will not undermine it. But I want to say one other thing, that Obama has signed it. And as you said, under international law, under our own American law, once we sign a treaty, we're committed not to engage in conduct that is contrary to the treaty. So in my mind, I'm pretending that we have that CRPD. And I think that that's where we should be, is to be positive, forward thinking, and say what will happen once it's ratified, but let's work on the fact that it's been signed. Here we go. Not to mention the customary international law argument that could be made as well without ratification. Michael, did you want to say? I agree about the importance of, of the convention, but I, I really like your um, answer, which went beyond that, which is that it's not only important just for, as a disabilities issue, but also because of all the other conventions on human rights. And they, you know, I'm, I'm a labor person, so the sort of injury to one is an injury to all. I also believe that defense of one human right is a defense of all human rights. The trick there, though, is that as a coalitional strategy to mobilize with other human rights groups on other specific kinds of rights and particular conventions, on one hand can be seen to add numbers and force, but on the other hand, it could also multiply the opposition to it in a certain way. And that's a, that's a difficult, you know, when in the politics of struggle, that's what's hard to know in advance. So you can anticipate that and try and plan around it, but it is a bit of a gamble. I think it's probably the very much the right way to go. But at some point, the United States has to has to really join the rest of the civilized world on human rights of all kinds, including uh, very much so uh, rights of people with disabilities. But it goes beyond that. I think they're all part of a package, and, and it's better to throw in with the package rather than fight each struggle purely individually. It doesn't. It's really not either or, though, because some forms you can just fight for the one set of rights, and others coalitions really matter. But there, it is to recognize a little bit of a gamble, but. It's the right game. I want Annie to respond. Then I do want to open it up in the last few minutes uh, to folks. So do we still do we have our roving, our rovers with the mic? We don't. Ah, okay, great, Patrick. I, I guess I just I do want to respond to to Michael's argument that we should be able to use it in litigation and we should be honest about it and not hide the ball. I'm not a litigator, and I don't pretend to understand all the different ways that litigators. Are able to make progress but my my common sense tells me that a judge that would read a right into the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities might read that same right into the ADA or a state constitution or any number of other things it's like does the judge want to get to that outcome and is this the only way the judge can get to that outcome or is this one of five ways 
the judge can get to that outcome. And I think that's where it would most likely come up. I would be surprised if there were a lot of cases where the only way to win was to get the judge to read something into the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. So, so I would just put that out there as, I get that there are creative judges out there. Thank God that there are some that are creative on the left. <laughs> um, and, and there aren't as many as there once were. Um, but I, it just seems like a stretch to me. Just like it seems like a stretch to me that the UN Convention is the most direct and, and effective strategic way to change guardianship law. And there are other ways to change guardianship law. So I just feel like some people are trying to do too much with this document. And that's the flip side to me of, of saying we're being disingenuous. Uh, I know we had some. Jenny? So I have a question here, which is maybe a little bit of a devil's advocate question, but also sort of a strategy question. It seemed to me like, to some degree, advocate for the convention are talking out of both sides of our mouths. If we're saying, hey, look, the U.S. already does all of this stuff. It's not going to change anything, and it's not going to cost anything. And now we're saying, oh, look, we can use this as a tool in litigation. And I agree, Andy. I don't think that this is necessarily the most effective strategy in litigation. But there's no question that it can be sort of an adjunct. It can be an extra argument. It can be something that adds weight to an argument that we may already be making. I mean, say you got to uphold the Constitution of New Jersey, and, you know, state law in providing equal treatment for people with disabilities or fair and humane treatment for prisoners. That's already there, and we have problems implementing it. So having one more thing that's already there that we're going to have a stretch of implementing, can't, it can't hurt. But is there a danger in even talking about that? I mean, are we talking out of both sides of our mouths here? Well, again, I think it's important to be clear who the we is, right? So um, Michael, in his wisdom, is a law professor um, whose job it is to be cantankerous and push the envelope. Uh, cantankerous? I am a pussycat. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, you're a law professor. You're not trying to represent a coalition that's trying to find a consensus position and sitting down with Republican lobbyists and, and listening to them about how best to frame the effort to get this thing. So it, I do think you, you have to compartmentalize. There will all, we have a rambunctious movement, as you know, Jenny. There will always be people in our movement that don't like the, the conventional wisdom about how to sell something on the Hill, but that doesn't mean that that conventional wisdom isn't the right strategy. If I can respond briefly. No, I mean, Andy, you're absolutely right. Uh, and I worked on Capitol Hill for five summers, so I'm not, you know, a virgin in that area at all. Uh, but I think that one of my roles, especially as a law professor who still clearly wears his litigator hat, I mean, that has not been discarded, is to try to come up with ideas to encourage lawyers to do these things. And I do see, frankly, there are quite a few areas, and I give this a lot of thought when I write this stuff, there's quite a few areas where I think, and maybe in New York and New Jersey and other states where there are robust state constitutional uh, decisions, maybe it's not as needed. But I believe there are other places where it would be, in fact, very, very valuable. And I think it would definitely be a step above and beyond anything that we have now. Let me just say that, so, so your record of articles will not come before the, will not hurt you when your Supreme Court nomination comes along. Is that what you're saying? A lot of other things okay. would, Steve. Yeah. Sorry, early reasons. No, I don't, I mean, I don't know how, um, I've just finished a book um, called From Charity to Human Rights, The Development of Disability Rights as a Human Right. And in it, basically, I argue several articles of the convention change not only um, the potential for the application of international human rights in other countries, but also in the United States. And I'm waiting for the ratification process to end before I kind of push it to come out, because I think, to be honest, as Jenny's saying, yes, there will be opportunities to use the convention, as Michael's saying, in ways that we haven't had that language before. The principles and the values, they're not quite the same as the ADA. But the bottom line is, does it really matter? I mean, I think in the end, more is at stake than whether or not there's a particular rut or there's a particular um, ratification vote. We are part of a world that's changed. We are, no, we are watching other countries develop very innovative ideas around disability. We're not the top of the heap anymore in many ways. We have things to learn from others. 
And I think that a ratification for me is as symbolic as it is substantive, that it means that we are now part of a world that's recognizing that there are international human rights for people with disabilities. And I really hope that we ratify. I hope we don't have to give too much in the process. But that it's not just a question of the litigation of cases in the United States. It's also part of a more of an international discussion. Uh, Michael and then, and then Chris. It's Chris, right? And then, yeah. Just to build on this real quickly. I mean, I think that we should talk out of different sides of our mouth to different audiences. <laughs> and, to audience, right? and that's part of what's going on here. But I think in terms of the public argument, or broadly, and to the political argument in Congress and to legislators and all that, should be play up, first of all, that it's not going to cost much, even though we know they should cost something and that litigation is going to make it cost, but you don't say that. For the reasons I said earlier, because there's all this, you know, fear of litigation and, and, and costliness. But the other part, I mean, I do think it's very important, the symbolic moral part. You should remember that Brown versus Board of Education was a product of the Cold War because the United States was having terrible trouble winning allies in the global south in the Cold War because um, of the record of um, Jim Crow and the slavery before that, this, and the treatment of African Americans in the South. And that is what forced the government to have to do something about that and went to the courts because neither party could do it because they didn't want to lose Southern white votes. And, but that, you know, the mor moral arguments and moral standing are about trust. And that is a form of power. And I think that it's precisely the moment when the U.S. is struggling to find allies for all kinds of activities around the world, including wars and avoiding wars and putting in foreign aid and all that. We're having trouble winning trust. And these kinds of failures to follow through with conventions and so forth hurts our, our stature in the world. And so that's a good argument to make, you know, because a lot of people don't know that history of the Cold War and Brown. And I, I'm absolutely certain that most legislators don't know that. They ought to be ed educated about that. But I think that is power. And, and that's, you know, there's lots of kinds of power, but that stature in the world is very important, and the U.S. is really short on it these days. And let's not wait for Somalia and South Sudan. Yeah. <laughs> Chris, go ahead. Thanks, everyone. Um, first of all, really fascinating. Um, Michael, I, I hadn't heard of you before. I can't wait to read your books. I wish I had the time to read all your books. <laughs> that, I, what you just said blew me away. I had never heard that before about Brown versus Board of Education. Um, but in any case, uh, I'm a litigator, and I... I from Los Angeles, and I'm so happy I had an excuse to come up here to Seattle and um, attend the conference and visit my sister who lives here, who happens to be a journalist, um, and who I feed disability rights to all the time so that she is on top of that issue and she writes it properly. Um, but I just wanted to comment on what Mrs. Miller had asked and what you guys said. As a litigator, I I'd certainly view the convention as an arrow in the quiver. And that's what it is. It's, as I understand it, and I haven't studied it, it, there doesn't, it doesn't provide a private right of action. I can't bring a lawsuit under it. But certainly, as litigators, what we do is we bring the action that we have a private right for, such as the ADA in California, the UNRU Act. And when there's a question that a judge is struggling with, we can pull out that arrow and say, look, Your Honor, public policy of not only the United States, but the world supports, you know, the decision in our favor so that we can win. Um, and, and I would also respond to uh, Michael Perlin in terms of the pessimism of needing government um, uh, funding to do this work. I, I certainly am, I, I, I hope that the government continues to do so, but I can tell you as a litigator who's done this for a while, the, so, the civil rights attorney's fee statutes are more than enough incentive to have plenty of private attorneys do this work. And it goes back to the lack of disability rights classes in schools, because if you don't know that this is out there, you don't know that you can make a living at it. And it's certainly doable, it's extremely worthwhile, and it's a pleasure to be with you guys. Please. I think we have time for um, one more question. Eric, I'll let you have the last one. Is there anyone? Did you have a back there? Um, Why don't you go first? I think we need to get the mic to the gentleman. Sorry, <laughs> told you get your exercise. Would you raise your hand again, please? Thank you. Bless you. Made it One of the uh, earlier speakers, just about five minutes back, uh, talked about how other countries are using CRDP very creatively could you talk about you know a couple of examples 
particularly from countries comparable to us? Um, two minutes or less. Um, India, for example. India, um, there's been an effort there to change their legal capacity law, which has been quite horrendous in the past, recognizing or depriving legal capacity of many people, that the Article 12 and the CRPD movement really motivated a group there now that there's a new law that recognizes that all people will have legal capacity and to provide supportive decision making. Wouldn't have happened without the CRPD. In Israel, a very interesting process where they've identified a new program to educate uh, law enforcement officers on working with people with intellectual disabilities as victims of crime so that they will no longer be dismissed as not believed. Um, when they can't orally communicate their experiences as criminal defendants. In, um, uh, let's see, in Cairo, for example, the U.S. Embassy gave funding to an organization to hire and train sign language interpreters who could be present at criminal court proceedings for people who were deaf both as victims and as defendants so they could participate in a meaningful way in the court process. These are just three little examples. I mean, they're not little, they're three wonderful examples. Um, that show kind of how the CRPD on a grassroots level is motiva motivating disability activists, people with disabilities and their allies to see how it could be interpreted and applied in a particular context. And to me, that's the most exciting. And that's what we can learn, by the way. And I'll say one more example. Under our ADA, Title III, in order to be able to gain access to public accommodations and it's not accessible, what do you do? You have to sue. Okay, so some countries are exploring this idea of creating um, people who will inspect buildings. You know, like when you're standing in the elevator and you have nothing to do, you may see a sign that says it's been approved for 20 people in this elevator and there's an inspection sticker. So the idea is to develop kind of inspection processes for buildings before they're built mm -hmm. to comply with accessibility and even universal design standards. Instead of waiting like they do in America, they tell me, to have to sue if a building is not accessible. So that's what I mean. I think we have a lot to learn from some initiatives that are happening in other countries. Um, and I hope that will be happening. Just to add to that, there are other countries as well. There have been several cases before the European Court on Human Rights, Stanev versus Bulgaria being, I think, the most prominent uh, involving a guardianship case. Uh, in Japan, which is a signer but only became a ratifier last month uh, in a voting rights case uh, in which a person uh, with an intellectual disability was stopped from voting and the Japanese court astonishingly struck down Japan's voting rights while Indicta cited the uh, CRPD. It's not available generally in English uh, translation, unfortunately. But, uh, I mean, and I give you these because, what you know, supplementing what Arlene said, that we're really talking about, you know, nation, industrialized nations, nations in developing economies. It's, you know, places all over the world, and that's very encouraging. And by the way, Chris, I would in some state courts bring a private cause of action claim under the CRPD in some state courts. I think I, I'm a Civ Pro teacher too. Shoot me, you know, but I, I would try that. It's twice you've asked to be shot. Be no, careful. Can, okay. can, can I add one other thing just in terms of the impact of the CRPD globally? I think. We have a first ever report from the World Health Organization on disability. I don't think they would have made it a priority to fund and do that report if the world wasn't studying how to implement the CRPD. The World Bank is revising their safeguards that they use when they, when they do some of their larger loans and they're seriously considering having accessibility requirements for the first time as part of their safeguards. So I think it's, it, you know, uh, Secretary Kerry went to the UN and talked about disability rights uh, on the day where, where leaders from around the world were talking about it. So it, it's, it's driving a conversation in important international bodies that probably wouldn't be happening if we didn't have the convention. Uh, thank you, everyone, for hanging around this far um, and for providing such insightful and thoughtful discussion today. It's really been a great, great program. I never had a class with Professor Miller, but I had the honor and privilege of serving as his research assistant during summer 2010, which was the summer before he passed away. And indeed, he worked right up until his final days. I knew him for less than one year, 
So upon hearing of his cancer's return in early 2010, upon receiving his heart-wrenching email at the end of the summer that he was stopping all treatment, and upon learning of his death in October 2010, I found myself asking, what prompted me to feel so attached to this man? Was it his long list of political and personal triumphs, including his status as the most powerful one-armed Jewish dwarf in the United States government? Well, I'm of the privileged generation that does not know what it's like to live in a society without the Americans with Disabilities Act, or for employers to be able to discriminate against employees because of their genetic profiles. Was it our shared East Coast Jewish sarcastic sense of humor? Or knowing that he would have had a heyday seeing his obituary published on the same page as that of the founder of Penthouse Magazine? <laughs> While these were traits that we will always value, I know that the reason I felt at such a loss was that Professor Miller was first and foremost a family man, and that every other aspect of his life fell into place around that. Coffee was a close second place. On the holiday of Passover, he opened up his home to all of the Jewish law students for a potluck seder, where we each received a bowl of plastic plagues, and Professor Miller read different versions of the Passover story that members of his daughter's class had written, many of which none of us had ever heard before. His computer wallpaper was a photo of Delia with her face painted, and I remember that in one of our weekly meetings, he spent the first half of the meeting telling me how much she enjoyed having her face painted. This was after I walked into his office while he was playing one of Naomi's mixes, music mixes on his computer. I could never actually figure out what his music tastes were, because one time I would come into some nice smooth jazz, the next time I would come to some quirky rap song, and the next time it would be Naomi's mix. We would plan our meetings so that he could pick up the girls from summer camp, or attend an activity with them, or so that he could stop by Scarecrow Video on his way home to pick up the movie Help for their Beatles-themed movie night. He was a man full of pride, not merely for his work single-handedly changing the United States, but also for his beautiful family and the times that they shared together. Throughout the summer, we not only talked about work, but we also talked about other essential topics, such as how he was able to get free Simpsons and West Wing DVDs, <laughs> our celebrity encounters, and my prospects for one day becoming Judge Judy's law clerk. I can only grin at the thought of his jokes, his booming laughter, and his genuine love for humanity. Professor Miller treated his students and colleagues and friends as members of his family. He reached out to people, treated them as equals, bought them coffee or lunch, and listened to their points of view. We discussed the possibility of my serving as his research assistant early on in the first year of law school for, the follow for my first one all summer. Um, and during the course of the year, he always sent me emails wishing me good luck, good luck on exams, congratulating me on my election to the Student Bar Association, and my invitation to join the Washington Law Review. It was not until the end of the summer that I learned the reason that he also asked me to work for Professor Masteriani during the summer, was that he was concerned he had assured me of a research position, that he was afraid his illness would prevent us from working together. While he was in the Berkshires with his family towards the end of the summer, he called me on the phone so that we could discuss a lecture that he planned to deliver in the fall because he was concerned that he was not providing feedback in a timely manner. On each project that I worked for Professor Miller during the summer, he would shake his head when I asked him whether he asked whether he had specific deadlines in mind, instead always assuring me to take my time and send it to me when you feel it is ready. A man who knew his days were numbered and that his time was limited telling me to take my time to complete his project. His primary goal in engaging with students always seemed to be sharing his expertise to empower students to shape the future. But he also never seemed to shy away from showing off his many achievements. Although Professor Miller was never one to belittle me during our work together, he did, however, at one point, rub it in my face that he had more Facebook friends than I did. <laughs> How many Facebook friends do you have, Rebecca? How many Facebook friends do I have? Yes! <laughs> Professor Miller was a mentor, a teacher, an advocate, and above all, a friend. I'm so grateful for all that he gave and continues to give me and to the world. Thank you all for coming today. Yes, it'll be a very short closing because I could not possibly uh, top uh, Rebecca's comments. 
I, it's, it's thrilling to have all of you here in honor of our beloved friend and colleague, Paul Miller. Uh, and I know that uh, Paul would be particularly happy uh, that we have a reception following this, uh, this wonderful conference. So as we all have the opportunity to chat about the uh, universality of disability rights, the need for the convention to be passed, uh, and our shared interests in promoting disability rights around the world. Uh, hopefully we can all share a drink and remember Paul as he would like to be remembered, a man who loved a party. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> This concludes the Paul Stephen Miller Memorial Symposium, exploring the intersections of international human rights and disability. Speakers in order of appearance, Stephen Rosenbaum, Kelly Testi, Anna Mastriani, Arlene Cantor, Andrew Imperato, Michael McCann, Judith Human, Carrie Griffin Bossas, Michael Gurlinick, Jennifer Meacham, Michael Perlin, Jamie Hawk, Mary Pat Truthart, David Carlson, Sharon Brown, Rebecca Levine, Patricia Kuzler. Moderators were Christy Ibrahim Thompson, Michelle Storms, Lisa Castilla, and Stephen Rosenbaum. The symposium planning committee was Stephen Rosenbaum, Sharon Brown, and Beth Riven. Co-sponsors were Disability Studies, Center on Human Development and Disability, William Gates Hall School of Law, Gender, Women, and Sexuality Studies, Program on Values in Society, Gates Public Service Law Program, Bioethics and Humanities Department, Department of Global Health, Department of Rehabilitation Medicine, Law, Society, and Justice, Center for Global Studies, and Harry Bridges Center for Labor Studies. Other co-sponsors are the Henry M. Jackson Foundation, Disability Rights Washington, and Jones and Ibrahim. Additional endorsement and or volunteer assistance was provided by the UW Center for Human Rights, Simpson Center for the Humanities, Disability Law Alliance, Center for Human Rights and Justice, Washington Law Review, International Law Society, American Civil Liberties Union, American Constitution Society, and the National Lawyers Guild. Special thanks to Jessica Dickinson, Lenny Hom, Hannah Hewson, Kathy Klein, Jennifer Meacham, Darlene Pickard, and Paula Kuros. Video production by Disability Rights Washington. Shot by Madeline Dagman and Quinn Jacobson. Edited by Quinn Jacobson and Tina Pinedo.